everybody here. So Kostin Alamariu has responded to some of the recent uh, news coverage of him and uh, not a whole lot of, of uh, you know, great content or great value in his response. He just goes on for about 40 minutes about how how mean people are to him. So let's uh, let's play a little bit of uh, his response. Because people just really, really mean now, to him. Or compact, same garbage. So these, you can imagine, the type of people, right? It's the worst kind of kiss-ass careerist, the kind of brown noser for a sclerotic old party guard. And li- okay, so it couldn't be that uh, people have any possible legitimate criticisms of him or the Politico article was pretty fair and even-handed. But uh, anyone writing about him in any way that he does not wholly approve of is incredibly thin-skinned. Late-stage communism, and not even a good career at that. I mean, it pays nothing. And that's the type of... Yeah, so according to Bronze Age Pervert, we should uh, judge judge the worth of a career by how much money someone makes and by how many views they get. People attacking me now for some reason. So it's either, as I say, conservatives, oddly enough, writing in far-left publications, the New Statesman and so on, or these for- uh, conservative rags, they hire an outright Antifa, really... For example, hardcore uh, whiteness studies type Antifa from Sweden, and they rely on people not Google translating this uh, person's articles that are in Swedish to see how he quetches about whiteness and such. And such creature now writes for supposedly dissident right or dissident populist right magazines in America, and most of the output is again trying to dox, harass anonymous posters and such. Oh, so just uh, simply identifying Kostin Alamariu and his life story, this is doxing. No, doxing means that you reveal private information about people, such as their home address, where they work, that uh, people would prefer to keep hidden. Right? When you become a public figure, like Bronze Age Pervert has become, right, simply mentioning your real name and that you went to Yale and you have a PhD in political science, that's not a doxing. And really to do what Antifa does, to raise up a mob against them or their families, to police the right so that no original ideas actually get through to outside world. The, so-, so it couldn't just be even-handed coverage. It could- well, they hope, but they make mistake because I have already bigger reach than their paltry circulation anyway. So, Oh, well, if, if he has a bigger reach, then, then he automatically wins, right? I mean, this is such childish, juvenile, uh, mentally ill uh, commentary. That's not the matter, but I just bring up to you uh, the oddity of it all, the conservative Antifa collaboration. Well, if it's so pointless, then where do you go on for about 35 minutes? On this same theme, you, you add nothing of value here. Oh, Which, if you listen to my show, I've talked about this for a while, but there's long been establishment uh, conservative collaboration with Antifa against me and also my friends, the faction of truth, you see. Because I'm not right wing or left. I'm not, an, I'm not a dissident. I just want the truth. I just want to speak the truth. These people are dissidents against the truth and good taste, also, I might add. I'm a moderate, cent- uh, yeah, moderate, uh, moderate centrist. That's me. And the lib- okay, this is just uh, plain delusional. Michael Anton had a pretty good book review of the Bronze Age mindset in the Claremont Review of Books, summer 2019 issue. Notes that conventional conservatism doesn't hold much purchase with large swaths of the under 40 crowd. Conservatism revolving around tax cuts, deregulation, trade giveaways, Russiaphobia, democracy wars, and open borders are not getting the kids riled up. What is the Bronze Age Mindset book? So much of the book is questioning or attacking attacking conventional wisdom on science, health, nutrition, often referencing some obscure figure whom most of us would dismiss as a crank. And in the book's perhaps most risible passages, the Bronze Age pervert, one is allowed where the history has been falsified, where the persons and events have been invented from whole cloth, centuries added to our chronology, entire chapters added to classic texts. It doesn't have any evidence for this, and so for a person who's supposedly all about the truth, you'd think he'd be interested in such a thing as evidence. So a key to the Bronze Age pervert uh, mindset and worldview is that life is all about a struggle for space, okay, as opposed to Darwin, which... Uh, who, who looks at life in terms of uh, re- reproductive success. So according to BAP, Ron's Age Pervert, all life seeks to develop its powers and master the surrounding matter and space to the maximum extent possible. The lowly, 
lower species, this simply means mass reproduction and enlarging habitat. So Bronze Age pervert generally has disgust with women and disdain for the family. For the higher animals, it means controlling terrain, dominating other species, dominating the weaker specimens within your species, getting first dibs on prey and choice of mates. He sees no fundamental distinction between living in harmony with nature and mastering nature. All animals seek to master their environment to the extent they can, and the nature of man is to master nature itself. So he rejects the Darwinian claim, the fundamental imperative of life is reproduction. He asserts an inherent connection between physical health, good looks, and human worth. And guess what? Many worthy people, valuable people, are sick and are not good looking. He defines his title only once. He calls the Bronze Age mindset the secret desire to be worshipped as a god, right? In other words, mental illness. He venerates pirates because they are free, the most free men, right? They are especially prone to violating the own space of others. They are radically disinclined to be hemmed in by custom, law, tradition, religion. So it's, it's not surprising if uh, Bronze Age pervert is an instigator for many different uh, crime sprees and, and killing sprees. There's nothing in the Bronze Age mindset that would effectively constrain those who have that predilection. So Machiavelli intimates that his primary purpose in his discourses on Livy is to prepare a certain subset of the youth to act when the time is right to overthrow a corrupt sect and to restore ancient virtue. So the Bronze Age mindset's written with the same intent can't find in the Bronze Age mindset any principled reason or any reason at all to reject or object to tyranny or to slavery, serfdom, perpetual peasantry, might makes right, warlordism, gangsterism, bullying, and uh, what most people would call injustice. So the only injustice that the Bronze Age pervert seems concerned with is the suppression of the higher by the lower. And I found a lefty podcast, which did a pretty good two-part series on Constant Alamariu, better known as Bronze Age Pervert. Here's an excerpt. Engineer. So his older brother, Dan Alamaru, is very conventionally successful. He like patented a method of securitizing political risk. Um, he's been executive director and the head of the U.S. country risk for the global investment firm UBS. Stuff Whoa. Like that. Here's another interesting thing about his brother that I love. Um, have you ever heard of the, like, every time you masturbate, God kills a kitten? Would have been big when we were in... I've heard that. When you were in like middle school, probably. Yeah, I don't know how true it is. That originated on the cover of a student magazine at Georgetown University in 1996 <laughs> that was managed by Dan Alamo. I was going to say, you're telling me this guy has something to do with it. Bronze Age pervert's brother probably invented every time you masturbate, God kills a kitten. Oh, wow. Dude, dude, that's just the beginnings. We haven't even gotten to Jim from the office yet. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, it's coming up though, uh, pretty quick. This paragraph even. Um, Costine went to high school at Newton South High. Go Lions. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of my favorite parts, too. It's something that's really funny. His junior year, he was the opinion editor of the school newspaper, The Roar. The Roar. Go Lions. Mm -hmm. Roar. <laughs> While the editor-in-chief was B.J. Novak. Oh, my God. A.K.A. Ryan from The Office. Um, yep. Another one of their fellow classmates who wasn't in the newspaper was Jim from The Office. He was there, but um, Jim and Ryan graduated the year before Baby Pervert. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Coasting graduated from high school in 1998 in his senior yearbook. Which is scanned into the Internet Archive in its entirety is simply amazing. He became the managing editor of The Roar, uh, and there's this great passage from the page about the newspaper. Quote, The Roar is 100% student-produced. From the simplest news article to broad editorial decisions, we do it all ourselves. We love this tradition because it lets us be wacky, zany, clever, or serious. Where else could you find crazy focus topics? Like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> a student showcase, a look into the tracking system, and, emphasis in the original, a centerfold on 19th century German philosophers, end quote. Hmm. That's some, kind of a weird thing to slip in there, don't you think? Yeah. I'm just like imagining, like I wasn't able to get a copy of that centerfold, um, <laughs> unfortunately, but I'm just imagining like Nietzsche just full Very rare. Yeah. So this podcast calls uh, Broad's Age Pervert a fashy and flashy Borat knockoff, which I think is an excellent description. A lot of good information and even some good analysis in this left-wing podcast as opposed to just this pointless, no value added rant by Bronze Age Pervert in his latest podcast. So I'll pay, play a little bit more here from Kostin Alamariu, the man himself, in his latest podcast. Liberal. I'm a liberal moderate centrist. I should make, I should go back to East Bloc and make a party in a particular country that does not at the moment have any interesting parties. I will call it the. I am completely delusional that he could start up some, you know, takeover. A government in a country. Moderate centrist party. But that said, 
It's funny, the unspoken part of all these hit pieces on me from all sides is how they uh, recycle the so-called research that was commissioned by one Luke Turner against me. And this is an Antifa, a major Antifa donor, funder, call it whatever you want, in London. That's where a lot of this comes out of. But these uh, articles... Uh, Ricardo says, Bap sounds like he's talking with a dick in his mouth. He deliberately exaggerates his Romanian accent. Uh, I mean, I obviously deliberately exaggerate my Australian accent at times. It, he's, I like this description of him as a fashy and flashy Borat makeover. I think that's pretty accurate. Because they never acknowledge the source, right? And nobody else, it's all hush-hush. The original hit pieces that came out against me from his immediate uh, Antifa employees got almost no views, but it's actually... Oh, well, views. I mean, that is the determinant of worth. That so-called research that gets recycled. And so far, at least two European Marxists who are pretending in American context to be dissident populists. They have recycled Luke Turner Antifa so-called research on me. Nobody calls them out. Which, by the way, I've told you long ago that I never addressed that. I would never confirm or deny these kind of petty doxing attacks on me and such. Okay, he just goes on and on, just absolutely no value added. So where there is value is in the new Netflix documentary on Wham! And this ties into Bronze Age pervert and his, his mindset. This new Netflix documentary on Wham! is a celebration of life and of joy and of, of having a good time. So when Wham! was releasing all its hits back in, what, 1983 to 1986, the, the critics just you know trashed Wham! repeatedly. But uh, Wham's music has held up well over time while that critical commentary has kind of fallen away. Now, I notice with the Bronze Age mindset and a lot of people on the alt-right, they, they compete to see who can go, you know, one down the most. That, uh, you know, life is just so awful. And I'm going to compete with you to show how awful the, the world is out there. And with, with groups like Wham, it's about having fun and taking advantage of the freedom and the opportunities that we have. There are a lot of problems with the world in 2023. There were problems with the world in 1983, but there's also a lot to celebrate. And in dissident political circles, uh, people compete in one downsmanship. Oh my God, you know, the world's so corrupt that if I just hold down a job, I'm just taking part in some kind of corrupt system. And so I, I noticed with people who adopt the Bronze Age mindset or many people who get red-pilled, they start earning less money, they have fewer friends, they have less ability to hold on to an opportunity. Go into a destructive downward spiral. Right, so it's not necessarily uh, great wisdom or profundity that uh, enables you to see that everything around you is absolute crap. Right, there are many good things in the world today. And just competing in one downsmanship is not a recipe for a good life, it isn't even subversive. Right, so in distant political circles, everyone wants to be subversive, but uh, the opposite way of going at life could be the real counterculture, right? Uh, celebrating life, celebrating opportunities. Both members of the duo are immigrant sons, so there's nothing like being relatively new to a rich, prosperous, free country. To perk one up, writes Janan Ganesh here in the Financial Times. Right? There's nothing like family law about real hardship to help one see through the phony nobility of modern angst. Of course, at no point in this Netflix documentary does either man, Andrew Widgley or George Michael, you know, dwell on such a, such a downer topic. All right back to this discussion on Costin Alamariu, aka Bronze Age Bowman. Beard down to here, you know? Yeah. Maybe Schopenhauer pinching in the <laughs> topless. That's what I like to imagine. I can't get that image out of my head, no. Well, I mean, that's how that's how you get red pilled, man. Yeah, that's true. That's how you get red pilled. Um, uh, some other gems from the yearbook. Uh, his senior photo is stiff as fuck. What do you mean? I mean, he looks like a TA. He doesn't okay. look like a student. Got he's it. um he's got like a suit jacket and a tie, and he's standing. His hair is cut super close. Yeah, there's just something about him. He just straight laced. Yeah, extremely. And wow, his senior tight. quote appears to be a passage, a nonsense passage lifted from one of his father's research papers. It reads in part, wow. quote. For resonant polysilicon microbridge vapor sensor, if there's a large amount of reverse diode leakage, the P region can passivate prior to reaching the end region, and so on and so on and so on. Mm. So, yeah. Um, there's one more photo from the yearbook <laughs> I want to talk about. Um, it doesn't have his name attached. Uh, it's at the front of the book. There's a section where there's like photos of student life, and they've all got like each page has like a what 
part of student life it's from. Yeah. Sports, pep rallies, outdoor activities, senior skip day, what have you. Yeah. And it's just pictures of students. And there's one that I am not 100% sure it's him. Um, but I think it is. It's a photo of a guy wearing this just like heavily textured 70s shirt with a big collar that like just flares way out and it's unbuttoned to like just above his nipples. And he's wearing like a ridiculous plaid tweed jacket and sunglasses and a giant blonde clown wig. This is what year we're talking about? 98. 98. And the caption reads... Brother, get out of here. <laughs> the caption reads, excuse me, but I think you're wearing my underwear. <laughs> oh my God. And the page it's on... So he's a cheese ball too. Dances. Mm. This is how he turned up to dances his senior year. Oh, yeah. I bet he was just the hottest commodity at that school. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not 100% sure it's him, but that is 100% that same, like, anxious, overwrought, pervert energy. Right. Um, and these are just snapshots, but I think we have a good sense of who he was going into college in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, he started by getting a bachelor's of math from MIT. An acquaintance of his from later in life told me that Coaston uh, said he studied math before philosophy because that's what Plato recommended. Okay, so who's adding more value here? This carefully researched left-wing podcast digging into the life and thought of Costin Alamario, a.k.a. Bronze Age pervert, or the pervert's own... Except to say that, uh, yes, it appears many art girls and other such uh, girls of high-taste girls from New York scene and other uh, world uh, think I am good-looking and uh, beyond that also like me, especially for what I say, which, okay, I'll get to that in a moment about, but you'll see why I bring this up. But all I can do now is call out the oddity of it all, the context of these articles. And I hear that there are also other articles coming out against me soon from other big publications. We'll see if they get canceled or if they go ahead with them. So on one hand, it's to be expected, I think, because on the one hand, it's very odd that there haven't been more mass media articles about me, you know. My book is maybe- Yeah, it's, he, on one hand, he thinks it's odd, but there haven't been more mass media articles about him. On the other hand, he thinks it's odd when there are any mass media articles about him. One of best-selling, maybe the best-selling, certainly far-reaching right-wing, so-called, if you want to claim that, uh, book. But, uh, okay, in the last few years, for sure, uh, I sell, I do far better than any norm normally conservative book, okay? You look at Amazon ranks and such, and for five years now, a bit more than five years, and yes, I know... Is anyone really after Bronze Age pervert? Well, he's absolutely convinced that they are, that they're trying to set him up for some sort of government prosecution, that he'll go on like some terrorist watch list. He claims that he had to leave the United States after some article was published about him a few years ago. So I don't think he's particularly well grounded in reality. He is undeniably brilliant. And he has undeniably done some genuine scholarship on the ancient Greeks. Friends are eagerly awaiting next book. It will come, and more than one. But so five years and almost no articles covering this after they were claiming for a long time that they, well, what is this frog thing? What do we want to see a book. We want to see a statement coming out of this sphere online. And well, here it was, but no, it was untouchable. It was given the silent treatment. Mike Anton bravely covered it in Claremont in 2019, but that was one case. And maybe you are not aware, but Claremont has a tiny circulation, and it was even tinier at the time. I, I personally, just me alone without frog friends. So we all tend to emphasize those metrics which show us to best advantage. So if I was speaking right now to 6,000 live viewers, I'd be talking about, well, uh, 6,000 live viewers can't be wrong. I'm obviously bringing you know, great content. Now that I'm speaking live to six viewers on YouTube, well, this is just an elite show. It's just only for the elites. We can't expect the, you know, the unwashed mashes to be able to understand such a high IQ show as this. So we always, have, most of us anyway, at least I do, tend to try to frame things in whichever light presents us you know, best. Had far more eyes on me at the time than Claremont did. I mean, speaking of light, I mean, have you, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I went to this Friday night singles gathering and I asked this woman out. And then when I saw her in the plain light of day, she was like 250 pounds and I couldn't even fit the, the seatbelt around her. So there have been several times where the lighting was a particular way. Oh, I, when I was 18, I met this woman at church and she looked great. She invited me over to her place that night to watch a movie. Then I went over to her place that night. And I think I arrived a little early and I saw her without her makeup and it was an absolutely frightful sight. And I, I'd seen her at church with makeup on it and she looked good. Then I accidentally saw it without makeup, and it just killed whatever ardor I had for her. So, yeah, the, the light that you see things in 
has a profound effect on your soul. Uh, because uh, my book had already been doing very well from the day, uh, the day it came out. Uh, one point of correction on these articles, the only uh, thing maybe I will uh, address, the only factoid, uh, they keep bringing up the Amazon rankings, but uh, forget, maybe conveniently forget that actually it got up to about rank 100 the days it came out, the week it came out. That's site-wide, okay? Now, there is some good uh, BAP content on his, on his podcast, such as when he had Manchester Mobag, a.k.a. Curtis Yavin, on the show. So let's play a little of that. It means absolutely nothing. It might as well not be displayed, you know. Yes, if I may interrupt, the reason many fr uh, frogs, and not just frogs, all kinds of people choose to buy the blue check now is because it, at least perception, it gives some protection from arbitrary banning. Um, if uh, Elon did what you say and kept the old system, but at least afforded people a protection from this, this kind of uh, capricious banning, and especially if, if he got rid of the rule of Liz Majesté against blue checks and journalists, which was introduced after Trump won. And that's what really ruined Twitter, because why was that so good? Because people could come into the mansions. You could talk back to these people. You could speak to your betters, right? Yes. And, and then, you know, it was the, um, it was the banning of, of, of Milo for making fun of um, um, this, this Michelle Obama type, yep. your tweet with the, uh, the Japanese royal family. Yeah, the Onibaba, yeah. This was a new thing, and it went downhill from there. I mean, you know, you were speaking of 2009 earlier. I remember even you know, as late as, as 2013, like, you know, I would say, well, you know, in theory, we need better free speech, internet, yada, yada. But of course, you can say anything you want on Twitter. You can say anything you want on Blogger. You know, it was really, it was sort of no one cared. And then this, this sort of, um, you know, thing springs up. I love Elon, but he's a boomer. As someone born in 1970s, I've worked very hard not to be a boomer. Yeah. Most of my friends are, are younger. You know, my woman is younger. <laughs> yes, this is power. Uh, there's a certain level of, you know, for, for a man, there's a certain level of, of it's a kind of success that happens. And the first time your woman is mistaken for your daughter. <laughs> no, this good. Yeah. Well, she won't listen to show. It's all right. Yeah. So you're like, okay, you have this nobility and, and your goal, you cannot abolish the nobility. Your goal is to master it. And there's a couple of things wrong with the legacy blue check. First of all, the, the new blue check, you might as well call it, you know, Twitter pro. This is an interesting conversation. I have my differences and criticisms of Curtis Yarvin and of Bronze Age Pervert, but this is a, a good conversation. This is the second most recent podcast released by Bronze Age Pervert. Oh, uh, showing those blue checks to when reading tweets is absolutely useless. They mean nothing. It's a visual clutter. Yeah. It tells you nothing about this person. You know, as I read your Twitter, I have no interest in whether you're a blue check or not. That use of, of, of blue checks, it shows that Elon is a boomer in a way because, you know, what he's really trying to say with the, the new blue checks is I'm not a bot. Yep. And, you know, the reality is on Twitter, bots are not a real problem. I, I disagree with that particular part, but I can tell you more in a moment. I mean, I agree with what you're saying about Elon. I, I know people who know him, and they all say he has very similar personality dysfunctions to Trump. I don't know. You know, and, and that's, in that kind of position, your attention span grows very short. As a reader of Twitter, I, I, I read, I don't tweet. Uh, you know, I can't, I've never even considered thinking of a problem with bots. I don't read posts by bots. Spam is incredible, though. It, it is, and it's not just business spam. It's, at least previously, there were these blue checks that you mentioned, the legacy blue checks. They regularly be used bots to boost themselves and many other such things. I mean, I have GOP, uh, excuse, I cannot use naughty words, but GOP pathics, let's say GOP pathics, who are uh, regularly trying to quote unquote correct the record and do uh, disruption radical networks and so on in my mentions. And uh, periodically, I, it's, it's completely artificial. Every few months, there's like 300 uh, spam replies. And, you know, it's obviously, I don't know if it's the, the Santis, the Negro campaign or what, but it's, it's something like that, some outfit like that who's doing this. And this, I believe, you know, the mentions, you know, whatever, that's like, you know, sort of should be an internal thing for the poster. But, you know, I'm in a unique position because I only consume content on Twitter. I don't produce. And yes. so as a consumer, bots are, you know, a non-issue. And, and so that, that check saying you're not a bot, uh, you know, uh, dear, dear Elon, I know that Bronze Age pervert is not a bot. I don't, need, I don't need the visual clutter. As far as I know, if I may say gossip on Elon, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you more, but, but uh, yes, and I should tell the audience that I don't usually drink when recording, but with a guest, it's different. So I have a bottle of champagne in. So excuse if I'm being indiscreet. But I hear from people close to Elon that in the beginning, after he took over, he half or 75 percent listened to his. Uh, Silicon Valley uh, billionaire friends, but that recently, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, he's cut them off. He no longer listens to their suggestions regarding Twitter. And so I don't know if this mistake he's doing today with the scraping and the rate limiting is related to that or who's giving him advice. I can tell the audience, I know, well, basically for sure, 98% without having access to documents that, uh, and uh, Moldbug, we are going to talk this on the show. We have time. We're going to talk it later. But there is some kind, whether a sincere traditional conservative tradcon or some uh, Fed cat, federal cat, uh, uh, traditional so-called e-internet Catholic, giving Elon all kinds of bad advice, uh, which mm. is why um, of the frogs, I was unbanned, I think because uh, certain people in that world like me and asked for me to be unbanned, I don't know. But, yes, I believe. but my friends 
have not been unbanned, and not one person in tw uh, Frog Twitter from original, uh, whether it's Mena, I guess, uh, uh, quite a few others, including Inkplot, uh, who was extreme popular account on our site, which simply posted animal videos, and he's permanently banned and hounded up. Okay, some great analysis going on in the chat. This is an Art House 40 stream. It's not a popcorn blockbuster summit movie stream. This is the 40 Sunday morning prestige show. He can't go lowbrow. He's up against to face the nation and meet the depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Good on your party. Don't go, don't go lowbrow on your Sunday morning show, right? <laughs> That's true. Like the highbrow Sunday morning shows oh, used to be a favorite part of uh, TV for me. Of the internet, and meanwhile, Elon is uh, bringing back all the most noxious, um, you know, face lords. Let me put it that the face fags, the people who went to Charlottesville, those noxious yes. sort of organizational ones, they're all unbanned. And I can tell the audience this for the first time. E, um, e. Michael Jones, who I have nothing against, I know I have friends who like mm -hmm. him, he was unbanned uh, the day Elon took office, uh, took over Twitter, that is, but without Elon's knowledge at all. And ever since then, the same group of you know, the whole people around the Kwania campaign, the Charlottesville thing, all the most noxious, aggressive face fags, the people that the feds love because they entrap people in these yes. idiotic public rallies, they're all coming back. But none of the smart, witty, uh, humorous frogs are coming back. We're all, you know? Yes, yes. There's something rotten there. And if I step back a minute, you know, there's an old aristocracy and a new aristocracy. And, you know, the real mission, if I were in charge of, you know, Twitter sort of socially, I think, you know, part of the problem is the sort of vision of, you know, the free speech internet, you know, the like intellectual dork web, yeah. uh, you know, those sorts of people, 90s libertards, and I was a 90s libertard, I know 90s libertardism well, I, I respect, right, but, but you have to get with the program, and the, uh, the, the, and, and, and your job it, it, to be king, it's, it's like a, you know, to be a social king in a way, and so you have to basically both constrain the old aristocracy and, and, and team it, really. And the blue check was a critical tool in taming these people, or it could have been a critical tool in taming the legacy blue checks. A lot of there's much disorder in, you know, I know people, they got a blue check because, uh, you know, they were at a party with someone who could give it to them. Some, some came through bribes. It was very disruptive. But, you know, if the king basically has a fight with the nobility, with all the counts and dukes and so forth, and if he says tomorrow, okay, there are no more counts and dukes, Yes. Everybody's no sir, no lord. Everybody's just mister. Yes. You know, the reality is there's still counts and dukes. And if he sells, then he sells, uh, you know, um, um, countships and dukedoms and so forth for eight pounds a month. <laughs> yeah, these people are still not counts and dukes. The great thing about old Twitter is that, it, you know, in, in the darkness, this new aristocracy, the frog aristocracy, the, the sort of dark, invisible aristocracy, flourished and it, it grew strong. Yes. And then later, uh, its enemies began to oppress it. You know, the capital, I'm, I'm a capitalist, I believe in capitalism. <laughs> and, and the capital of Twitter is reputation capital. Yes. And, and the reputation capital is not yours as, as CEO. Charging money to your best content producers makes no sense. You should earn more money off of them than they produce. Yes. I, you know, but you should earn money off of their content and you know, perhaps even share that money with them. That is one thing he's doing that could be good. Uh, but you know, to basically find them for existing, this also makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. You, want, you want to you know, take these people and perhaps even regular, regularize, formalize this blue check even more. You say, okay, you have a legacy blue check. Why do you have it? You know, come in, apply for this. You know, let's confirm that you're really a noble. You're really okay, it's a kind of fun, interesting discussion there between Manchus Morbug, a.k.a. Curtis Yarvin, and Bronze Age Pervert. And uh, let's go back to this biography of Bronze Age Pervert, a.k.a. Kirsten Olamariu. He eventually got a PhD in political science from Yale. Um, Interesting. Yeah. One of his at MIT. At MIT. Is that where his dad died? Okay. So now one of his earliest writings is from his time there at MIT. In 2000, there's a rant about limousine liberals in the school newspaper that includes an interesting line directed at a previous letter writer, quote, for God's sake, keep your engineering minds away from political and social problems, <laughs> um, which is sort of prefigures his later rejection of rationality. Sure. And his sort of like crazy persona. Which, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of those big ideas in the next episode. Just focusing on biology for, or biography for now. I don't want to know about his biology. That's not, yeah. That's it's probably point. a lot similar to mine. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Oh, okay. So after this, after uh, his time at MIT, he went to Columbia to study philosophy, get his master's in something related to philosophy. Uh, there's a 2005 letter to the campus newspaper from this time period where he defended a Harvard professor who, quote, raised some very reserved questions to a private body of faculty about whether there might be innate differences between men and women in their intellectual abilities and preferences. Well, anyone who teaches any number of students will tell you, generally speaking, that their most brilliant students tend to be men, but that the girls and the women tend to get the highest grades because females are much more predisposed towards conformity and coloring within the lines. Boys and men tend to be much more aggressive and challenging. 
So yeah, there do seem to be substantial differences between men and women. Also, uh, in IQ distribution, there are far more brilliant men and stupid men, while women likely fall much more in between. So it wasn't just some Harvard professor, that was uh, Larry Summers, the president of Harvard University. October 2006, it's like not really particularly noteworthy. Um, it just attacks a bunch of articles that had recently been published in the paper as being too liberal. Interestingly, um, in the same paper, there's another student writing to comment on a homophobic prank that was played on the Yale campus anonymously. Now, there's nothing connecting it to Kostin, um, but there's something like very alt-right about the prank. It's like anonymous emails were sent to students en masse during Pride Week, uh. which included the lines, What are you coming out as today? Are you a racist? Embrace the hate. A homophobe? So is Jesus. A male chauvinist? A Nazi? There's no shame in being who you are. Just remember admitting it doesn't make it right. Um, there are also posters put up around campus. Ostent right, so what kind of student is the most likely to do a whole bunch of work outside of class that doesn't have any effect on their grades? So certain students, women, and I'm thinking of one other group, are most inclined to, will this be on the test? What do I need to study to do well on the test? But male, uh, frequently white students are much more likely to go bonkers, go all out studying all sorts of things that are not going to be on a test just because they, they find it uh, interesting and, and compelling, while other people are much more conformist and careerist. Sensibly by the National Organization to Gain, Gain Acceptance for Your Sins, the acronym of which spells no gays. <laughs> now this particular incident, it's too moralizing. He is not a moralist, and this <clears throat> incident is too moralizing for me to think it's him, but I think it, it like highlights that on campus at the time, there was like these undercurrents of the same kind of like playful but threatening aggression right. that Kosin is just like mastered. Totally. I mean, in the, the alt-right writ large, right? I mean, like that's why we... Okay, if you don't like the current regime, all right, if you don't like that the left dominates almost all of our institutions, uh, how, how could there not be some current of aggression and rebellion against that? You associate like Pepe the Frog and like playful cartoon imagery with like some of the most virulent, racist, homophobic misogynist things out there well his time at yale is actually the time period that i like the best image of because several people that he was there with were kind enough to speak to me so first is stephen smith smith's a professor of poli sci there at yale um he was coaston's thesis advisor wow so he probably had a pretty good look at him you hear some of this yeah you seem to know a lot more about him than i do but but what can i tell what can i tell you maybe maybe to start off with you could just tell me about um your experiences with Almaru, how you met him and your impressions of him uh, he entered our graduate program. I can't tell you what year exactly. I'm, gu I'm guessing it was, you know, I don't know, like 2006, maybe 2005, and was interested in ancient political philosophy uh, in particular. He was always sort of shaped by Nietzsche in, in, some, in some significant way. Mm -hmm. That was also... Okay, I'm playing video on the, on the screen of uh, Stephen Smith, famous political science professor at Yale University. He's got a lot of... Uh, Lectures on the history of political science on YouTube. Vaguely connected with Leo Strauss uh, and Plato. Uh, he also, I mean, this this would tie into the uh, maybe the Bronze Age stuff. Uh, Costin always had an interest in sort of I would call it kind of deep anthropology, kind of warrior society. He was interested in uh, the themes of kind of warrior aristocracies. I mean, that to give in a way more sort of anthropological uh, support to Nietzsche's ideas and so on. Now, those, those were some of the things he, he was interested in. Those were sort of the um, with the boundary posts of his sort of intellectual world in a lot of ways. Aside from like his academic interests, what, what were your impressions of him? He was always a mystery man on campus, whether that was that's just his natural disposition or whether it was something he just wanted to cultivate. He was always a kind of somebody who cultivated an aura of kind of maybe sort of secrecy. Kostin was not close to many people when he was at Yale, but he had something like a friendship with uh, another student named David Lebeau, who was, uh, he's pretty, he's pretty lefty, actually. Okay, so it doesn't really matter that the people doing this podcast uh, are lefties, all right? As long as they're practicing, you know, good reporting techniques, they, they enlighten and enliven and uh, provide more, more depth and, and knowledge than we previously had. Now, um, he's actually who turned me on to Wendy Brown, and his essay, Trumpism and the Dialectic of Neoliberal Reason, though that sounds super boring, is just like, just like blew my mind. It's really good. It's, it was like an early inspiration for this podcast. Okay. Um, Lebeau is the Associate Director and Assistant Senior Instructional Professor in Law, Letters, and Society at the University of Chicago. Just a little note here, again, I don't want to get too deep into Kostin's philosophy right now, but uh, Lebeau lumps Kostin in with the alt-right, and Kostin himself has disavowed the term as meaningless and misleading, but he only started doing that after the Unite the Right rally. Right. Um, before that, <laughs> he did things like tweet, hashtag, we are the alt-right. Oh. So who knows? Uh, if Kostin's worried about people misrepresenting him, uh, he shouldn't be such a fucking weirdo about what he wants. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, so whatever, who cares? Anyway, here's Lebeau. From the get-go, Kostin was alt-right. He was always um, out to, to provoke and it was always telling a line between the ridiculous and the ominous. 
um, <laughs> and you could never tell what was a joke and what wasn't a joke. And you could never tell if he was saying the things just to upset people or whether there was something that he actually believed in, um, which is, I mean, it's perfectly all right. And this is already yeah. from the very beginning, 2000. So there's a video that uh, was sent to me from a Ralph supermarket on Doheny Drive near me, and a half-naked woman was throwing around pies. <laughs> and I, I saw the video. I found it hilarious, but I was struck by how a friend of mine had a completely different reaction. He says, I, I shop there. I take my kids there. My kids go there. He was horrified by what happened. So I think when you don't have offspring, and particularly if you're not married, if you're a bachelor, you're much more predisposed towards a nihilistic view of life. You, you don't th take things nearly as seriously. I notice whenever people get ch children in particular, when they start having children, they get much more serious about life they feel much more vulnerable. They become much more interested in, in trying to make the world around their children as, as safe as possible. And so there's a, a maturity, I think, and a sense of greater responsibility than to just yourself that comes with having kids. And Kostin Alamariu, aka Bronze Age Pervert, apparently not one for real life bonds, not one for having a girlfriend, sustaining relationships or getting married let alone having children. Six. So I had, for the most part, um, a very playful relationship with him. So, I mean, some of his playful jokes are there were some emails about our dental coverage as graduate students, and he wrote on this one about dental coverage. For those interested, my cousin Dento runs Dento Magnificent Dental Emporium. He made good dental work in White Van at Grand Avenue and East Street in parking lot outside plumbing supply stores. He forwarded me a small price of 100 He do work, steal, keep gold, keep anything you want. It's, uh, it's almost um, it's almost a uh, boron. Yeah, so there's that. Um, oh, and then his other jokes are things like this. He, he sends an email to the list looking for an apartment sublet. And he says, if anyone knows anything about someone renting out an apartment, this is 2008. Mm -hmm. Renting out a room or apartment next month, please let me know. The tenants and staff of the other building were conspiring against me, and I need a new place for a month. <laughs> uh, and I take, this as, I take this as him just joking. It's like, all right, it was a joke where if it got a rise out of you, you won. Yeah. So the best thing to do was to play, as, play it as a joke. Um, that, that made sense as a strategy 15 years ago. <laughs> At that point, there was a playfulness to it. Yeah. Um, I probably thought he was harmless because in any other world, he would be harmless. And without the rise of the all right, he would be harmless. And whether he, whether the fact that he already existed then was a sign that the all right was coming or whether it's just a accidental confluence of his own personality and broader phenomena, um, I, I don't know. That characterization kind of reminds me, I mean, I hate to say it, but like of me and my friends growing up again, I, I know I said it before, but like we were kind of shit stirring types, you know, public prank artists and class clowns and kind of disruptive types. But I mean, I think our, teachers and our parents. Yeah, so people who get married and have kids, right, who put a great priority on their education, on their professional success, on their standing in the community, right, they're much less likely to engage in a lot of this kind of pot stirring, juvenile prank stirring. Parents, we had a lot of good influences, you know what I mean? That helped steer us in the right direction. But again, I feel, Unfortunately, I feel a little level of like understanding and kindredness with this. With what? Huh? And as soon as he said that, I was like, "Oh yeah, of course, Bronze Age perverts doing a fucking Borat thing." Right. <laughs> so, um, that's David Lebeau. A second one of Costine's classmates spoke to me on the condition of anonymity, citing the quote speculative nature of this project. And um, I can't the blame. A, yeah, I mean, I can't blame a serious actor. The first. Include his impressions of Costine. What about um, Elmaru's politics? Pretty sound. Elmaru's politics were from the first, you know, extreme hard right. I can recall Alamaro uh, used to work out in the Yale gym wearing an Israeli Defense Forces t-shirt, which he wore. I mean, the point of it was to provoke argument. Like any college campus, there are lots of critics of Israel in its relation to Palestinians, uh, in particular critics of the Israeli Defense Forces in the kind of uh, uneven sorts of wars that they wage against Palestinian populations. And so Kostin would work out in the gym in this Israeli Defense Forces t-shirt and sort of relish the arguments that he got into. Was he very sociable? Um, did he keep to himself? Was he able to like shut himself. off? I had, you know, you would have you have encounters with him in various kind of odd circumstances. Like I said, in the gym, I can remember discussing his Israeli Defense Forces T-shirt with him, or I, you know, one time encountered him in the library where he had an enormous stack of CDs that he was converting to digital, and, and having a good conversation about classical music with him. Actually, he had a lot of cultural capital, a lot. Like he just knew a lot about the history of ideas. He knew a lot about classical music, and he liked to show off that knowledge. You know, he seems like a person at the start of graduate school who would be successful and have an academic career. Um, is there is there anything else that you think is like noteworthy? About Eleanor? No, I mean, like I said, I thought he was a 
I, you know, he's a guy that was intriguing in some ways. Intriguingly well educated, basically. The kind of person that you wanted to talk to and could learn something from that you talked to. But then just extremely. Yeah, most people are somewhat reluctant to say that any of their peers are, are noteworthy or extraordinary. All right, because it, it, you're, giving, you're giving them higher status. Unpredictable and odd. Like, you never knew when he was putting on some kind of odd persona. None of that should surprise you, um, but it's worth noting that, like I said, like you and I are white dudes. All, all these so I, I also identify with that. I put on a lot of really odd personas. Like, what type of person spends a lot of time and effort going into odd personas? I probably who lacks a sense of ease with himself because he lacks normal human connection. When you have normal human connections, right, people value someone who's stable and predictable. So if you have people who love you in your life, they're going to want you to be stable and predictable. It's upsetting. It's annoying. It just exerts a cognitive and emotional load when people are not predictable and stable. So the type of people who can afford to or incentivize spend a lot of time and effort creating personas are people who lack normal human connection, All right? We prefer people in our life who are stable and predictable. When people start putting on different personas, it's tiring, it's annoying, it's exasperating, it's often infuriating, it bugs us. Like, why don't you be real? So this bloke putting on all these different personas, I suspect didn't have you know, much ease with normal human relationships. People I spoke to were white dudes. Hosting sees as at least potential equals. Um, mm -hmm. He doesn't feel that way about women. More complicated thoughts about people of color. But even still, they all agreed that he was odd. The word creepy was used. Sure. I can see how that would come to mind. Here is the anonymous classmate. So I can recall this one incident. Probably David LeBeau was in this class as well. But we were in a class uh, with a professor uh, named Shayla Benavid, and she was uh, teaching actually some Carl Schmidt. Now, apart from Leo Strauss's use of Carl Schmidt, there are some prominent uh, contemporary left-wing Schmidians who uh, argue that kind of populism is a, is a better and purer form of democracy. So, so these are known as left Schmidians. I was sitting in the seminar and kind of arguing and half collegian has got some good challenges in the chat. He says, look, you are confusing the high-functioning, high-IQ crowd you run with with society at large. These sweeping generalizations seem stale. So Bronze Age perverts, a profound thinker, created a persona to brand more effectively to spread his content. No, he had this persona many years, even decades, before he started spreading uh, uh, content. Why is this disparity such a mystery? It's not a mystery. It's what people do when their lives are empty, when they're real self is not succeeding they try to make up selves to see if these made up selves will be more effective at life you look you are pathologizing every human eccentricity with this refrain about human connection maybe in asian conformist societies not in latter-day latter post-enlightenment ones in real life people prefer you to be stable people need you to be predictable if you're in someone's life every day they need you to be predictable people you work with and see every day need you to be stable and predictable. When you are not, they will swerve against you. You will become, you will take up too much bandwidth in their mind. So I'm thinking about this one difficult woman in my life and the best description I heard of her was that she, that it's hard to deal with her because she just takes up too much bandwidth. We don't have like unlimited amounts of bandwidth. We only have so much bandwidth, so much energy. And it's exhausting when people are unpredictable and unstable. So people who are married with kids, people with respectable jobs, right, people with friends and people with connections that they're interacting with every day, all right, they're not going to be able to maintain these you know, stable and prospering ways of life if they're unpredictable, eccentric, unstable, and putting on all sorts of different personas. Right? If you doven at shul every day, the people that you're connected with there are not going to put up with you coming to shul with a different persona on a regular basis. They're not going to put up with you, you know, putting on all these different airs and trying out different accents and you know, wanting to be called by a different name and changing your, your sexual identity. Right? That doesn't fly with normal people who only have limited bandwidth and they need you to be stable and predictable. If you're not stable and you're not predictable, people will not want you in their life, whether that's in America, Australia, England, France, Germany, Nigeria, Japan, or China. On behalf of some left Schmidian ideas, really for the sake of argument, and then after class, uh, Kostin kind of 
you know, came up to me on the street outside of that class and literally lectured me for about an hour, you know, over my objections. But, like, I was just kind of playing devil's advocate in class a little bit to tease out these ideas, yeah. but he was really uh, exercised about the... Yeah, that's another sign of someone who's really socially maladjusted is when they keep talking to you when you don't want to be in the conversation, right? When I've often... <laughs> I almost said cornhold, but I meant buttonhold people because I want to get something off my chest and they're just dying to get away. And uh, it's when I'm at my socially maladroit phase that this happens. It's a really poor trait and no one likes to be held hostage against their will while you carry on different personas or you start ranting about stuff. Uh, idiots against that political position and argue that Kaufman needs to be a philosopher of the hard right wing, which is what he was doing with him. Um, he also, you know, other philosophers he was into would have been like Joseph de Mest, who's a French monarchist, uh, Juan Donoso Cortez, a Spanish monarchist, certainly a right winger, you know, maybe even a kind of uh, neo, you could even say maybe a neo fascist, uh, certainly a, a strong critic of liberalism and democracy. And he, you know, told me at some point that he was living in his car. So it's like not the worst thing in the entire world to end up in those kind of circumstances, but it seemed discordant given his kind of. Now, I, I am someone who's shown up to Minion every day for years and years and years and years, and there is a stability in, in those connections. And people at Minion would understand if I put on a different persona when doing a YouTube show or when performing a one-man play or performing stand-up comedy or if I'm an actor. Right? People understand that, but they don't understand in, in daily interactions why uh, on different days you just have different personas for seemingly no reason. If people have a rational reason for understanding why you're trying out for a new acting role, that's why you're trying out a new accent or a new persona, then they'll be much more forgiving. But if for no reason whatsoever, you're coming out with new accents and new personas, normal people in your daily interactions are going to find that that just takes up way too much bandwidth. Totally. Right-wing, monarchist, old-world, high-culture persona that he put on. So you, you use the, the phrase neo-fascist to describe him. May I ask why you chose that word? Was it because... Yeah, because of this association with Carl Schmitt in particular, uh, you know, who was a definitely enthusiastic Nazi fascist. As I say, there are kind of two wings of contemporary political theorists that invoke Carl Schmitt, one of which is this left populist Schmittianism, the other of which is uh, what I would characterize as kind of a neo-fascist, uh, hard right-wing uh, uh, philosophical position. He always also seemed very disappointed with the nature of the graduate education that he was getting. So he said he came to Yale to study with... Okay, so this is a podcast that I'm playing here from a podcast called Unbalanced. It's a left-wing podcast. And this is uh, Logan, a left-wing journalist, conducting an interview with a Yale University classmate of Costin Alamariu, a.k.a. Bronze Age Pervert. Stephen Smith and, and Brian Garston, who are there. Oh, and there's another point there that I wanted to comment on, that Costin uh, Alamariu is very disappointed in Yale. So Costin Alamariu is very disappointed in almost everything and everyone. Like everyone and everything disappoints him because he has unrealistic expectations. So he's mad at the modern world. You know, he's, he's mad at the different parts of the modern world that he encounters. He's just continually disappointed. No, I wouldn't really characterize them as right wing in any way. And Coaston seemed disappointed about that. And he was definitely disappointed about having to take classes with anybody else. Certainly didn't want to take classes about anything except the topics that he was particularly interested in. And then he kind of, then he kind of uh, at some point, just dropped off the face of the earth, as far as I knew. So Smith, Coaston's advice. Yeah, he drops off the face of the earth at the same time that this Bronze Age pervert persona takes over. So the online personality right, takes over, and the real-life Costin Aramario kind of goes into a recession. They said he wasn't surprised that Costin was disappointed by Yale. Well, I think the direction he's gone tells you, you know, kind of where, where he was trending at the time. There was one moment when he submitted his dissertation, or a draft of his dissertation to me, I was very upset with his talk about eugenics and so on. And it, it's, the Yale graduate program is not the kind of place to give him much support. Brian and myself were probably the closest uh, to him as, as teachers, and yet, uh, you know, we, we were both in some ways really, uh, frankly, sort of appalled at some of the directions he, he's, he, he was taking. But, uh, you know, maybe it's a, also an example of the kind of Nietzschean, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, and it, it provided him with grist for the mill that he's now churning out. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Quite frankly, you seem a little exhausted as we have this conversation. Like maybe this is a difficult topic. I wanted you. to say he was a brilliant student. Uh, in many ways, head and shoulders over many of the people uh, in our program. I thought very imp impressive intellectually. 
Absolutely. Well, his personality made it difficult. That's who, that's who he is. I mean, he was a, a brilliant person with a with a uh, difficult personality in some ways. But um, so difficult people don't find many people who want to put up with that, right? We we don't have the bandwidth to put up with many difficult people in our life. Somebody who 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 I felt really had extraordinary talent. I wish it had been put in a different direction. I imagine that's something you probably don't see very often these days. I'm not, I couldn't peg it exactly when like eugenics died out, but I mean, it was not until it on that and I'm sure it's movement, you know. He, was, he has a thick Romanian accent. He's, um, there's something ominous and dangerous about him. He was, he was a Dracula out of Central Casting. <laughs> I don't know if I want that being my quote, the Dracula one. <laughs> I prefer something more intellectual. <laughs> But he didn't technically go off the record. So uh, he eventually changes uh, four user name to Pandolf Iron Man, which was like a medieval Italian aristocrat or some shit like that, um, before settling on Bronze Age Burr. Weird. But uh, the fora, this forum, is sort of... Yeah, so he went through a lot of different online personas before he settled on Bronze Age Pervert. 4 pretentious cousin. Got um, like they've got philosophy instead of memes, and there's like even a mechanism for members to engage in formal debates. Oh, wow. Um, it does have the same sense of humor as 4chan, though. If you misformat a search... Uh, an error message pops up, and to cycle past it, you have to click OKKK. OK. Hilarious. Uh, so funny. Threads cover topics that range from high art to gutter racism. Mm. I want to say, Miles, his first post is really, it's like sweet in a way. How so? Quote, I ask everyone to forgive if my first post should be a disagreement with a long-standing member. End quote. So people who are disconnected from others, they, they feel that pain and... They will often post on the internet about how to connect normally with other people, which is what Kostin Alamariu does here. And then he goes on to suggest that Plato's Republic should be consulted when they're building a list of potential alternatives to democracy. Mm. Sweet. For Bronze Age pervert. Sure, yeah. Uh, this forum is where Kostin developed his ideas, his project, and his persona. Uh, he was active on the forum for like seven years, so I didn't do like a really thorough accounting of everything he wrote, but I asked our InfoSec consultant to scrape the website. So Sweet. If there are anybody who, need help. who really want to just pour through a fascist virtual cafe, seven years worth of a fascist virtual cafe. No, he's going to scrape it up till 2020. It's going to be more than a decade. God damn. DM us. Well, uh, I'll just hand it to you after we get it. Yeah, come help um, us. So this is a full accounting, and we're going to dig into his actual ideas in the second episode, the next one. So I won't go into detail, um, but he's much less guarded in the forum than pretty much anywhere else. There's one post in particular I want to read in its entirety from September 2010. It might be the most earnest thing Coasting has ever written. Um, it, it's misogynistic and bitter. I want to like, I don't want to downplay that. Content warning. But it really is a moment of weakness that's like touching in its way. It gives me a little hope that even Bronze Age pervert is underneath it all, like kind of a fragile and salvageable soul. He writes, quote, What's to do in this case? It's been years, and this rather pretty girl I know all of a sudden wrote me now and wants to meet me. She's been strangely insistent, but I believe it is dishonorable to meet her. The reason is this. At the time, I made advances which she resisted. True, she had a boyfriend, but I took this as an insult on her part. Now, after many years of absolutely no contact, she wants to meet. I interpret her writing me now in this way. I believe she's been letting herself get banged right and left by all manner of men other than me, and now she's decided to give me a try or something like that. I take this as deeply insulting and, and am considering not writing her back. But as I'm not a malicious man, and as right now I'm incredibly bored, I've returned some of her emails. She jumped on my first suggestion that we meet for a drink. Should I do this? End quote. There's just something about this that seems like really earnest. It's like, it's like he developed his misogyny. As a re yeah, getting in touch with how you're vulnerable, right? Th that's kind of the beginning of wisdom, right? Getting in touch with how you've made mistakes, getting in touch with the people who you love, right? That is the beginning of wisdom. Right, coming from a place of gratitude for the love in your life, accurate recognition of the vulnerabilities in your life, right, that's a path for producing responsible commentary or writing or humor on life as opposed to this uh, Bronze Age pervert persona. And uh, comment here on Twitter. Someone started watching the stream, Arthur Trilby, after Colin Liddell tweeted it. And Arthur says uh, that I'm right about people in your life being stable and predictable. I've seen daft parents pretending to be an outlandish character for fun with their kids. But after it gets boring, the child will say, stop it. I don't like it. I want mommy or daddy back now. It's unsettling when people in your life are unpredictable. Exactly. The action to like getting re rejected by women is a way to protect himself. And here he is. He's in a situation where like a woman is like reaching out to him. And all he has to do is like let go of his misogyny. And it's like, it's like changing. People are, are making bids. If you're at all a normal person, people are making bids for your attention, uh, whether it's to go for a walk, to share a coffee, to get a cigarette. And if you knock them back a couple of times, they'll stop bidding for your attention, right? They will work next to you for years and they'll never bid for your attention again. So part of the way that I may have developed socially <laughs> the past few years is to start to recognize when people are making a bid for my attention and to recognize it 
and to acknowledge it and if possible to to you know appropriately respond back rather than ignore or denigrate chafing against them i mean it seems like one of his first inclinations is to turn to this forum and ask yeah. for advice as opposed to like taking a look inside yourself thinking about it for a day or two i don't know hey go to reddit talk to our relationship advice make a post sure yeah. this is a neo-nazi web forum that is exactly talking about this in so yeah and the rest of the thread like like that just devolves into this like bro posturing like everyone's like super eager to show that they think it's super gay to talk about being into girls like, wow so the one opportunity he takes to like you know open up talk about his feelings or something like that you know be a little bit vulnerable and these guys just fucking dogpile him and then it's like you can hear his accent getting thicker he says uh, he responds to the advice uh quote I'm not looking for a wife. I consider myself a seducer and corrupter of pretty girls, and it is precisely my failure at bagging her while she still had BF that is the gall of it. I make sport of such things, since unattached girls are not challenging enough. And so making sport of uh, playing with people's affections and feelings is really antisocial. It's destructive for yourself. It's destructive for other people. Right? This is someone who's in an antisocial spiral. End quote. Okay, so then the next couple of years, Kosin's just gone, but then he shows back up in 2017, sending emails gloating about Donald Trump's victory to his former classmates. He also did contact me after the election on Facebook. He was deactivated. And so gloating about things that uh, others might be very sensitive about, not a good method for maintaining, developing relationships in your life. Briefly reactivated his account and sent me a message <clears throat> January 1st, 2017. He's deactivated again, but I remember definitively the um, the icon for his Facebook page was the was Pepe, and it just said "Happy New Year, Trump is Prez," um, and then he then he disappeared again, and I didn't respond. So the next couple of years, Costine published a handful of essays under his real name, uh, including a couple for the far right magazine Talkies Mag in 2016 and 17. Uh, that, that's where Richard Spencer made some of his bones that way too, right? Mm -hmm. For Talkies Mag, he left there to found the alt right. That's right. The name of the magazine found mm -hmm. after leaving that. The author's bios for Talkies Mag says that Costine at this time period in 2016-17 is, quote, currently traveling in Europe and writing a book about the lives of tyrants in ancient Greece and Renaissance Italy, end quote. At the same time, Bronze Age Pervert was building a following on Twitter. Hilariously, when he started his account in March 2017, Costine described himself in the Bronze Age Pervert user bio as, quote, step barbarian, nationalist, fascist, nudist bodybuilder, end quote. Um, okay. I read somewhere, I think it was a political article. It's a lot of information there, man. You sure you don't want to, like, edit that profile a little bit? Oh, yeah, he did. Just going to bear it all, huh? Yeah. Quite literally. So I read somewhere that Charlottesville was supposed to be like a coming out party for the far right to sort of bring fascism and white supremacy inside the Overton window to sort of like make it okay to be a Nazi in the way that like Occupy made it okay to be a socialist. Oh. Um, Unite the Right happened August 11th and 12th, 2017. And the Wayback way back Machine at the Internet Archive caught a snapshot of his Twitter profile a week later, August 18, when he still identified as a fascist and a nationalist. But something changed as the fallout from the rally became clear because the next snapshot on November 2nd, he sort of put his fig leaf back on. He no longer identified as a fascist <laughs> or a nationalist. And he downgraded himself to an aspiring nudist bodybuilder. Oh. Oh, well, way to hide it, bud. Right? <laughs> All um, out the window. Still, in the period after Charlottesville, Costine finally realized success. His book about the lives of tyrants never materialized, but on June 6, 2018, Bronze Age Mindset was published on Amazon. Um, and it has made a splash. The Dark Enlightenment thinker Curtis Yarvin, a.k.a. Mitch's Mulebug name, dropped into a Vox journalist for an article that was published less than a week before the book dropped. After the publication, Yarvin further recommended the book to Michael Anton, author of the Flight 93 election, um, and former national security advisor to Donald Trump. Anton wrote this 5,000-word review for the Claremont Review of Books. There's that name drop by Powerline. I mentioned up at the front end, and it just makes me wonder how many other like minor conservative outlets sort of gave it air early on. Right. Minnesota State Senator Roger Chamberlain is a fan, and Politico reported that the Trump White House was full of staffers who read the book and pointed out that one of Matt Gates' speechwriters was also a fan. The book has maintained its popularity, and Pervert has continued to develop his project and build following. He was banned by Twitter in August last year, but moved to Telegram, where he currently has more than 17,000 followers. Um, he's also begun to write long-form essays for extremist outlets, which I won't name here, but one of those outlets hosted a three-essay symposium on his work, sort of following the lead of the Claremont Institute, which publishes the Claremont Review of Books, which once published a six-essay symposium on Bronze Age mindset. Now, this and I think it's hard for people to really kind of like imagine just how influential this book has been to uh -huh. this movement, you know? Yeah. So there's a bit of back and forth here because Anton writes the review, Pervert writes back to him, and then Anton responds to the response. Okay. And this is what Anton says. BAP is a short for Bronze Age Pervert. Quote, What of those readers who don't get the joke? How might they interpret these and other Bappian declamations? Or, more to the point, what might they do? At a prosaic level, I suppose I have in mind the following. I wonder if BAP has read or seen the film version of The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. In it, an inspiring, vaguely Nietzschean and not so vaguely fascist teacher casts a spell over a number of impressionable girls. One of them takes quite literally to Miss Brody's exhortation to fight in the Spanish Civil War, runs off to Spain, and is killed. What would BAP say, or think or feel, if a reader not so finely tuned to irony took up his exhortations? End quote. So Anton wrote this in 2019, and then we fast forward to December 2021, when the aggrieved white dude Lyndon McLeod killed five people in the Denver metro before being shot and killed by a suburban police officer. I don't know who the first person to discover it was, but Luke Turner on Twitter posted a thread of McLeod's tweets about Bronze Age mindset. Mm -hmm. McLeod, writing in the margins of the book, praises the book 
and highlights several passages. In one, he rewrote a passage from the book, one of many that sort of glorifies sudden eruptions of destructive, even literally suicidal violence by men. The passage reads, quote, It calls on us to allow ourselves to be possessed by it and to wage war on its behalf against its enemies. It being this like masculine willpower. Mm -hmm. It's above and beyond all things, I guess. One of the things I'm confident saying about Kostin is that his philosophy is, to paraphrase Wendy Brown, unrational without being irrational. Like, he really privileges intuition and instinct in, as a way of knowing truth. So like next episode, we're going to dig into that. But his thoughts, like his philosophy, is for him kind of a way of... Yeah, so a good uh, overview here on the biography of Kostin Alamari. Finding and understanding his instinct, which he seems to think is the true source of knowledge about truth or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So what I mean is that you can't really separate his politics or his philosophy or his project from his instincts, like the feelings he has about himself and about the world and about his place in it. And like what we're going to talk about next time, his life story highlights some of the contradictions in his thinking. Because I've been saying he's really smart and he is, but like there are big problems with the sure. things that he writes. But we'll get to that. I just want to end by paraphrasing like, the brilliant Todd Snyder um, in one of his admittedly less brilliant songs, but it's still very appropriate. Bronze Age Pervert's real name isn't even Bronze Age Pervert. He's a skinny public high school kid from Massachusetts, not some monster from out of this world. Like a lot of other skinny public high school kids, he was sick of getting beaten up by the point guard all week, only to go out on the weekend and watch the quarterback get all the girls. So, he became a fascist, man. Right, here's uh, Bronze Age Pervert in recent podcast talking with... Well, yes, you should hire a business guy to do the business, but be the king of the society. Yes, you must I... understand the society. You must feel the society in your bones. And the truth is, you know, the king is, you know, yes, he's the champion of... He protects the people against the nobility. He also has to protect the nobility. You know, he protects everyone. And so to say, like, to go to war against the blue Cheka by taking away their checks is just, this yes. is not how you master the nobility. You have to make them serve you and love you. Look, yes, he has many problems. I agree with you, including... Right, let me fast forward a little bit here. Not being killed, and, and you know, and, and I look at these. Uh, I look at these countries. You know, in London, in London, you don't yet have the tents. You know, the beggars. Yes. Uh, you know, it's not a thing. You know, it's it's lovely, but 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 time will catch up. I mean, you know, they, yes. they're already. Uh, you know, it's a human rights violation and so forth. And yes. of course, uh, you know, these uh, shadowy figures are trying to burn Paris as we speak. Uh, you know, the French state is reacting, keeping them out of the. You know, the only healthy part of of. of, of Remember, you got all this uh, distant commentary, including on Jean-Francois Garapie's channel, predicted that uh, France is falling. Well, it doesn't appear that France has fallen. Instead, they appear to have done a pretty aggressive and assertive job arresting and prosecuting uh, rioters. So maybe uh, the French law enforcement apparatus is not as... Uh, incompetent as many dissidents expected. Paris is really a France. The only healthy yes. part is the countryside and, you know, the, the, the old cities, which are theme parks, you know, yes. and everything else is either, it's one kind of suburb, which is a sort of, it's either Bugman suburb or uh, or barbarian suburb. Yes. And, you know, neither. Yeah, France, just an absolute hell hole. I mean, come on. I, Paris, by and large, is a, a beautiful city. All right, there, there are vast swaths of France that are that are gorgeous. For these things is a, is a credit to, to, to France. And so, you know, and especially I want to remark on a subject. I don't know how you feel about <laughs> sumptuary laws. Yes. Laws regulating clothing for, for because I feel that, that when, I, when I walk through the streets, I see, you know, it, well, it's a sort of double, double whammy because, uh, <laughs> you, you know, these people are poor, you know, physically, physically they're sorry specimens. And then they drape these sorry, these bodies. It's, it's, you know. Okay, a great deal of contempt for one's fellow citizens. So as a, as a nationalist, all right, you should feel a bond with your fellow citizens of your of your people of your nation and want to uplift them and want to assist them so this this is definitely not a nationalist perspective you know that they've neglected yes. for decades are draped in these these shapeless clothes that you know yes. uh, 50 years ago not even not even a bum would wear these clothes I, I was talking to mike anton on this subject the other day and he uh, he laughed at me uh, because i said uh you know the scientists for all his posturing in florida you go by side of highway you often see obese woman in capri pants with a mulatto child in tow and this is yes. an eyesore and uh, if i was running uh president i would seek to to correct that as you say through sumptuary laws and uh he remarked you know uh Bap, for all of your sensible uh feelings and proposals i don't think they would have much popularity with american people but i mm. i agree with you uh, as a campaign program you know but i agree with you on this yeah. no no he's thinking he's he's this is old thinking you know i love I love Anton, but but he's a man of the last century. You know, it's like uh, fundamentally popularity only means something when when the people are strong. When the people are weak, you know, uh, it should be they should they should sort of follow in reverence. You know, because uh, sometimes the people are right and sometimes the people are wrong. Sometimes the experts are right, sometimes the experts are wrong. Right? There's there's no group that is always gifted with truth and wisdom. Not even ourselves.
is like when you know one, one thing I, I say often here I am in England in London you know and I say that London England is less democratic than it was in the age of Mary Tudor and, and why do I mean that I mean that because democracy is nothing more than the formalization of the power of the mob when the people are strong uh, you know I mean that's absurd to say that uh, England is less democratic now than when it was under the reign of Mary the Tudor. Like, how many people are there in the United Kingdom? 70 million, 60 million, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, a million determined people can do anything. Yeah. And there were far anything, anything. No force can resist them if they are truly determined. And, you know, the and, and there is no, I mean, a military force ready to shoot them can, can do a lot. But, you know, truly determined people, even non-lethal riot police, you know, can't do. Well, you had about a million determined people in France rioting. They seem to have been put down rather effectively by the French authorities. Much. Yep. And, and it's sort of the weakness of the mob. Whereas if you look at the London mob 500 years ago, you know, they would have a rumor, some opinion. They would say, oh, you know, the Germans of the steel yard are yes. undercutting good Englishmen in the wool trade. So let us kill all the Germans in London. And they would proceed to do their best to do that. And, you know, you can say it was an age, it was an age with, with far more themos, you know. Yes. And please do not insult me by saying themos. And uh, there was far more themos. I, 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 Okay, let's uh, fast forward where they discuss how to pronounce the, the Greek. You know, and right, so uh, right. they know that. But look, Moldbag, I don't mean to interrupt you. This is becoming a long yeah, segment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I... Let me fast forward. The night for, uh, yes, it's not a huge hotel room, but it's something. Imagine right. doing that in New York. You can't even do that in bumfuck middle of nowhere, United States. Yes, and in, just... New York, and, in New, and in New York, your hotel room is cleaned by a slave, you know, like yes. someone who is, who is not socially connected to you at all. Whereas in, in Japan, actually, your hotel room, they don't really have gasserbeiter, you know, yeah. in yeah, Japan, yeah. right? They actually have work for, for Japanese people. Yes. And, you know, the, 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 you know, the simple... The simple policy, uh, you know, there's so many. I mean, you know, the purpose, the purpose of government is is national greatness, which is the greatness of every person. That's not the the purpose of government. That's a luxury of government, right? The purpose of government is to enable the nation to survive. Second purpose of government is to operate things in the best interests of the people and their progeny, right? Uh, doing great things is a luxury. Right, that's not the primary purpose of government. Within the state. And, you know, let us take in Florida, you mentioned, you know, the fat woman <laughs> with the mulatto child in the Capri pants, yes. right? You know, first of all, you know, this clothing is clothing for a child. It is demeaning, you know, either, you know, if you were a noble, in a modern sumptuary law situation, if you were an adult noble and you wear clothes in a calculated way to adorn yourself, to show your self-actualization, because the mission of the noble is self-actualization, is to become become amazing in a, in a personal way, then you should wear whatever clothes you, you want as long as, long as they're not, as long as they're amazing. And if they are not amazing... Uh, the, the position of the noble, like the position of the worker or the bourgeoisie, generally speaking, is to get married and have children. Most people find their meaning in life through their family. That is true for the working class, for the middle class, for the upper class, for the nobles, for the aristocrats, for the workers, right? Most people get their meaning in life from their family, not from what they wear and not from this abstract philosophy. It is fine because the other nobles will laugh at you when you will not go out dressed in your sweatpants the next day. You know, yes. for, for the woman in the Capri pants, uh, it's very simple <laughs> to say what she should be wearing. Um, if you are unattractive and yeah, unworthy, yeah. you should be wearing a uniform. A burqa is a kind of uniform, you know? Yeah. So you don't see upper class women, particularly in England, you know, with bad legs because upper class women, generally speaking, who don't have attractive legs, they, they cover, cover it up. So, yeah, generally speaking, the upper classes dress more sensibly than the lower classes. OK, this is uh, part two of the Unbalanced podcast here, examining the thought of Kostin Alamariu. AKA Bronze Age pervert. Like, ground yourself in like a sense of egalitarianism and respect for people, and you'll be okay. Uh, this book isn't gonna like brainwash you. Find the book for free; it's on the internet. Don't give them money, and uh, just make sure you're clear about your own values. I think um, that's good advice. So even these lefties don't try to make the case. Oh, you shouldn't read the Bronze Age mindset book. Especially the "don't give him money" part. <laughs> right. Quick trigger warning: uh, This episode is the third sentence of the book is quote I hardly have anything to say to most who aren't like me. Still less do I care about convincing. Unquote. So. Starting off pretty strong there. Yeah, right? Like we, For we, confidence. <laughs> well, is, is it yeah, that's a pretty good uh, summary of the Bronze Age mindset. 
and more clearly than anywhere else, calls for a fascist revolution. In this chapter, he alludes to the Heian period of Japan, writing, quote, The imperial bureaucrats grew useless and weak, and by the end of this age, all the actual physical power was with the samurai. What I find amazing is how long it took them to figure out they no longer had to listen to the weak commands of the imperial hierarchy, and that they were actually the rulers. End quote. He explicitly compares Heian period values, uh, which he names honor, duty, divine right, to modern liberal concepts like legitimacy, soft power, and rights. And he calls them, quote, delusions meant to distract and obscure men of power from their own strength and aims and put them in service to someone else, end quote. Hmm. He continues, quote, eventually they do realize, however, that they don't have to listen and that they are actually the ones who rule. This moment when the game is up, the moment of revelation is what I've always found very amazing. In the modern world, everything moves much faster. I expect that not long from now, such men will awaken in the West and I suppose other parts of the world. The central point and purpose of the book and of his project is to make a fascist revolution conceivable, to sort of outline how his uh, disciples could lay the foundation for one and to sort of imbue and let's be real here. If there's anything like this kind of revolution, millions of innocent people would die. I mean, that's, that's what would happen in this kind of revolution and uprising. And in all likelihood, we would live under a far greater tyranny th than we do now. View fascism with uh, positive connotations because it's, it's a dirty word. Right. It's not unlike the secret. Uh, he's just in the visioneering stage of the revolution right now. Oh, boy. Yeah. What was the whole term about the secret? So... Why would uh, Bronze Age Perver kind of have a mindset similar to The Secret? Because he's a very intelligent man. And when you're an intelligent person, you get a great deal of pleasure from manipulating ideas, concepts, consequences of philosophies in your head. You spend a great deal of time in an abstract world. You become disconnected from real life. You'd be more in real life if you're less intelligent, because if you're less intelligent, you'd get less joy out of spending time in an abstract world. We all tend to spend time in those things that we're good at, all right? So some people spend their spare time playing video games. Other people play, spend their spare time uh, playing basketball. Other people spend their prayer time, prayer, uh, meditation, good deeds, uh, going to movies, knitting jewelry. All right, we do what we're good at. We're naturally inclined in different areas depending on our genetic predispositions and our early imprinting. You know, you see it, you manifest it. You yeah, know, you exactly. Just, if you just think about exactly. it hard enough, it'll, it'll come true. Oh, Lord. He's trying to manifest a fascist revolution. Yeah. Or maybe he's just waiting for the world to collapse. And so what type of person yearns for a revolution, even though it costs millions uh, of you know, dead, innocent people? But the type of person who doesn't have much of a life right now, who doesn't have people who love him, doesn't love people, isn't connected or bonded with people. If you had a family, you wouldn't be yearning for a revolution. It would very likely put your family at risk. So Jean-Francois Garapi lives in north of uh, Canada, lives a very isolated life, and uh, he feels like he's well positioned to sit out and survive any revolution. But if you're a normal person with normal human connections, ties, people that you love, family, friends, a profession, interests, hobbies, community, a, a church that you care about, a synagogue that you care about, a volunteer organizations that you contribute to, right? you wouldn't be yearning for this kind of you know, violent revolution. I remember there were two times in my early childhood where I deliberately set fires. And why did I do that? And as I understand it now, I kind of wanted the outside world to reflect my inside world. I think all of us kind of want to make the outside world reflect our inside world. If we're unhappy, then we want everyone else to be unhappy. Right? If we are not getting the prestige, the, the titles, the success and honor that we believe is due to us, then, then if we're isolated, and living in a fantasy like uh, Kassan Alamariu, a.k.a. Bronze Age Pervert, then, yeah, we'll be very predisposed to wanting to overturn everything. I remember when I was saddled with over $50,000 in credit card debt between about, uh, 20, between about 2012 and 2016, 2017, I was much more amenable to radical solutions than when, starting in 2016, I started getting my credit card debt tamed. By 2018, I had it all paid off. I uh, started saving money, I became much more invested in the, the, the present government, the, the present situation that was enabling my growing prosperity. And just assumes fascists will rise to power. Um, Maybe. But, yeah. Well, you know, even the pen name, Bronze Age Pervert, is a reference to the Bronze Age collapse. And the pirates that he and his fans like talk about all the time mm -hmm. um, are the sea peoples who, are, who were theorized to have accelerated the Bronze Age collapse with their advanced forms of warfare. Oh, wow. Oh, so how did I get uh, $50,000 in credit card debt? 10,000 of it was reckless spending on how to make money online uh, because I was no longer able to make a living writing online. 
but I was able to take that knowledge and I probably earned about with that knowledge adjacent to that knowledge, probably about uh, $80,000. So I, I got it back. Then I spent uh, $25,000 on my Alexander technique tuition. And then I wasn't earning very much money while I was studying to become an Alexander technique teacher between 2009 and 2012. So a lot of living expenses were paid then in in 2012, I entered the full-time workforce and I wasn't able to make much progress with my debts until I got into various 12-step programs with regard to earning and, and debting. And uh, by, by 2016, I was working 40 to 60 hours a week and substantially paying down that credit card debt. I also maxed out my credit cards in 1995 as I took a year to write my first book, a History of X, 100 Years of Sex in Film. And then I paid off all the credit cards by early 1998. So two times, I, I guess, fairly deliberately maxed out my credit cards when I was trying to launch myself into a new career, whether as a writer or as an Alexander Technique teacher. Yeah, he's, he's an accelerationist. If, if he's not calling for an out-and-out fascist revolution, he's an accelerationist. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's getting to. Like, this is what he's working on. This is what he's on about. This is what he's doing. And we can't discount a numerological significance to his book, Climaxing, on chapter 69. <laughs> oh, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put it past him. No, I wouldn't put it past him. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't either, knowing what we learned in the last episode and all of his little zany antics and things. Well, not only that, but he went to Yale specifically to study with Stephen Smith, mm. um, who's one of the leading experts on Leo Strauss in the country. And one of Strauss's key ideas was that philosophers who had dangerous thoughts sort of hid them imbued their work with like esoteric meanings. That Fora post where he's talking about numerology and Machiavelli's chapter numbers, he's referencing an essay Strauss wrote about Machiavelli. Wow, okay. So the multi-layered quality of his project, it goes beyond just his writing though. Uh, like for instance, he used to troll journalists who wanted interviews by directing them to a homoerotic BDSM story called Dominated by Doug. It's, uh, <laughs> it's an 18 part, 105,000 word story that was published online from 1998 to 2004. I guess the pervert's a big fan. Just nonsense trolling, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Well, in the first sex scene, Doug rapes Clay, the narrator. Oh, Lord. Who decides he loves it halfway through. Oh, Jesus. Um, then you get I'm to... I'm not religious, but I keep saying, oh, Lord, or Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> this is a lot. Coasting. Yeah. Well, then you get to the last sex scene, and it's a literal sexual hierarchy, with Clay on the bottom, who's getting fucked by a man, who's simultaneously getting raped by Doug on top. In the final paragraphs, Doug expounds on his ideas of a kind of hierarchy of human types, uh, with men above women, but some men know better than women, and only a small number of real men at the top. It's super fucking rapey, super fucking fashy, and perfectly in line with Kostin's ideas. Yep. So, all his shit does mean something then? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I could write a, a book with 70 <laughs> chapters and do something funny on the 69th, you know? I mean, <laughs> doesn't make a genius, but I mean, I can see the point you're making. <laughs> well, there's another Fora post I want to share. It's, it's in this long thread on one of his posts. He's talking to people about, like, esotericism in writing. And somebody makes the point that, like, Nazi architecture was designed with different materials that were stronger and weaker so that they would decay in a certain way to leave alluring rooms for future generations to rediscover fascist ideals encoded in the architecture. Interesting. I had no idea. They're having this conversation in the context of talking about encoding or doing something similar with writing okay. to try to make it intriguing to pull people in. Hmm. Elmaru is part of a movement, the alt-right, and a key part of their project has been to craft like alluring cultural artifacts in which they can embed far-right ideas and ideals. One of the functions of his big grand Nazi architectural esotericism, you know, when he names all these philosophers, when he is spinning these wild mythologies about lost civilizations, um, he like invokes the image of mutant lizards calling the herd, just like all that shit. Like it's, it's there to entice the curious and self-assured sort of into a, into a labyrinth mm. that he's made. It, like it doesn't matter how many of the like little passages to his writing just dead end. It's supposed to be intriguing and frustrating and encourage people to crawl through this muck and shit you talked about Josh Hank earlier, <laughs> <laughs> looking for some deeper meaning, but the shit in the muck you're crawling through as you look for the deeper meaning is the deeper meaning. It's ship hosting. Right. Right. So this is a left wing analysis, but it's pretty profound. It's pretty accurate. It's value added, unlike uh, a lot of Bronze Age perverts' rants. It's rickrolling. It's like just the whole rainbow spectrum of edgelord shit, but imbued with like political and mystical significance. Right. By politics, I mean fascism. By mysticism, I mean, like, uh, there's this guy, Julius Evola. Mm -hmm. had, like, he was a fascist thinker, and he developed like this mystical, esoteric ideas to justify. Fascism. Yeah. You know, I said last time that Michael Anton's review of Kostin's book is pretty solid, and it is. In it, he quotes that same Strauss essay, mm. um, the one about Machiavelli that Kostin referenced in that Fora post. So this is Strauss by way of Michael Anton. Quote, 
The ruthless counsels given throughout the prince are addressed less to princes, who would hardly need them, than to the young, who are concerned with understanding the nature of society. Those true addressees of the prince have been brought up in teachings which, in light of Machiavelli's holy new teachings, reveal themselves to be much too confident of human goodness, if not the goodness of creation, and hence too gentle or effeminate. Just as a man who is timorous by training or nature cannot acquire courage, which is the mean between cowardice and foolhardiness, unless he drags himself in the direction of foolhardiness, so Machiavelli's pupils must go through a process of brutalization in order to be freed from effeminacy. Yeah, so you get brutalized when you read Bronze Age Mindset. <laughs> okay, looking at the chat, uh, Hoff Galician says, in literature, particularly death elegies, this is called the pathetic fallacy that uh, nature itself mourns the passing of the person. Whereas in reality, one realizes how unimportant a man is as nothing in nature reflects the sadness of the mourners. Luke, you should re-release your memoir, Rebel Without a Shore, but with a new forward by Dennis Prager. <laughs> Who was a greater thinker, Leo Strauss or Neil Strauss? My friend says, I studied the works of Neil Strauss and put the theories into good use. Luke, you need to send Julie Hartman, Dennis Prager's YouTube co-host, Rebel Without a Shore, it might be the one work that could help her regain her lost trust trust in societal institutions. End quote. Anton follows that quote by saying that reading Costine is, quote, certainly on one level to undergo a process of brutalization. <laughs> Basically, he's like curating a museum of thought, and like he's arranged all his favorite thinkers and ideas in strands of cultural DNA, and then he invites readers to just go and explore it at their own pace oh, yeah. and following their own interest and curiosity kind of like a wax museum <laughs> he's curating a, a wax museum gallery <laughs> exhibition just for really, weird dead old guys leaning hard into like the image of him as like christopher lee dracula <laughs> <laughs> well, i can't get the schopenhauer centerfold out of my head from the last episode <laughs> well in his in his work uh you know back to that centerfold like you said you know Kosen, he includes nietzsche obviously and uh Schopenhauer, but he also includes people like Hartiste, who's like a fascist adjacent or peri-fascist pickup artist blogger nice. um He's the guy pervert begged to come back, you know, in that short clip we heard at the beginning. Okay, this is uh, Chateau Artiste. Beginning. He's the guy who inspired all of Costine's wackiness. But at the same time, he, he, he's very careful to erase any leftist thinkers that influence him. Mm. Like, nothing that he includes in his little museum contradicts his message. Mm. Now on to the next part of our extra... So a lot of Orthodox rabbis try to disguise and they deliberately fail to credit any non-Jewish thinkers or non-Orthodox thinkers who have influenced them. It's the sign of a very closeted mind. Someone is just solely concerned with the reactions of his own particular in-group. Someone with with no, you know, wider or greater loyalties to things such as you know truth or fairness or accuracy. Jesus, a Bronze Age pervert. <laughs> What's that word? Exegesis. Oh, jeez. It's one of those words that, like, like I know I'm using it right in that sentence, and I'm not like I can't quite tell you what the definition is. Right. I don't even think I have enough money in my bank account to be able to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to know about his book? Yeah, let's let's do it. Okay, how you doing? Let's check in here really quick. You, you just letting the waves roll over you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm good. You know, I'm I'm just, I'm good. <laughs> you don't sound good. I'm good. I'm good, baby. I'm good. Yeah, this is fine. This is part of our rent for living on this planet. Is just trying to fucking <laughs> understand this asshole. I like that. Yes, this is. We're just paying our dues here. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are four parts to his book. Part one is titled "The Flame of Life." Mm -hmm. No surprise, the flame of life is Costine's vision of transcendent masculine violence. He spends most of the first part of the book talking about this idea without really saying it clearly, and he spends the rest of the first part of the book just associating the already... I wonder how much real-life experience Costin Amario has with real-life violence. So I suspect that uh, many of the people who theorize about how wonderful it would be to have a violent revolution have never even been punched in the face, that uh, one good punch in the face and they probably wouldn't valorize violence nearly as much. Fusing value, idea, word, cloud of a concept with positive connotations. Mm. So at the end, the result is this very inspiring and like kind of vaguely erotic mess of like this violent, masculine, beauty, truth, value, goodness, strength, joy, laughter, murder, suicide, master, race, word, feeling, vital, energy, cloud. <laughs> the flame of life. Mm. That's it. I knew exactly what you were talking about when you said that. I want to redo this. Flame of life. The flame of life. <laughs> <laughs> We should add some echoes to the back of that. <laughs> so it sounds like the Wizard of Oz or something. Now, one could probably untangle this mess of an idea, but this is what I'm talking about. Crawling through the muck. Like, any time the book makes you curious, you really have to ask how willing you are to debase yourself. Um, the only one I got down and dirty with here uh, was the bit about vitalism. For example, you know, you read the book, and then there's, uh, here's just a sentence comparing various Indo-European language family words, which Kostin insists, completely without evidence, quote, all ultimately refer to a kind of vital life force capable of superhuman strength, end quote. And then... Sounds like something I want. 
Yeah, right? It's like, yeah, give me this. Right. Go kill yourself and everyone you know. It's the manliest thing you can do. Here's another. Quote, in the beginning was the word? No. In the beginning was the demonic fire that bursts out in men like Alcibiades and lays low the cities of men and exposes all their nonsense. I wonder if he's like a Megadeth or an Alice Cooper fan or something, too, because this is very metal. It's vital. It's vital writing. Yeah, vital. Yeah, I mean, you're right. He's like trying to shove these like rousing feelings into it, right? But it's fantasy. Mm -hmm. Like, this is just not how the world works. His whole like mystical thing that he sees up there in the sky bears no resemblance to anything I've ever experienced in my life. Right. Me uh, either. Now, of course, you would probably say that we are just bug men. Yeah. Uh, basically, we're too effeminate yeah. uh, to have ever really drunk deeply of the pure man, vital beauty, truth, feeling soup. Um, <laughs> Needless to say, I find this unconvincing. Yeah. Um, but again, he's not writing for us, man. He doesn't actually have to explain any of this shit. True. It's his clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And we can't come in and play if we don't play by his rules. Mm. So let's let that be for now. Okay. Um, but when I have been talking about like how he privileges his instincts or when he privileges his emotions or his feelings um, as a way of knowing truth, like this is what I mean. Um, he's just asserting that he has this almost mystical connection to some deeper truth. You asked me to try and understand what is appealing about this guy. And I think I was never a very religious person. I always uh -huh. had good influences around myself, but I also like learned to trust myself early on. And yeah. so I feel like I have a... So I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist, and Seventh-day Adventist is obsessed. Seventh-day Adventists are obsessed with the end of the world. All right. Uh, the Branch Davidians, uh, David Koresh, they came from the Seventh-day Adventists. My father did a PhD in apocalyptic, meaning what will happen at the end of the world. So I was raised that uh, God was you know, going to come down to earth and consume almost everyone in you know, fire and the elect. Right, those who are truly with Jesus, they will escape to the mountains when the forces of evil, those who want to institute a national Sunday law, try to chase us down at the very last moment. You know, Jesus will swoop down and save us. So this kind of apocalyptic revolutionary vision is uh, very emotionally familiar to me. Strong sense personally towards my intuition and towards my instincts. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I essentialize that or that I place my instinct above anyone else's instinct or give of machismo. Populist propaganda that there's these undeserving elites, the wrong elites, the wrong people are elites at the top who are crushing from the top and then invading hordes, crushing the middle from a below, mm. you know, and then the good people are caught in the middle. I mean, this just sounds like fascist anti-Semitism, really. Like, that's that's what they relied on to fill this gap in their... Othering, yeah. Yeah, this ideology. And not just the othering, but the conspiracy aspect of it. Um, if reality reflects supernatural truth, and if that truth is the superiority of the strong and the strong-willed, why aren't they already in charge of everything? Right. So, like, fascism needs a conspiracy theory. They need, like, it needs an explanation as to why the weak are stronger than the strong who deserve to rule because of how strong they are. <laughs> and so what Coaston does with this bug life, yeast life thing is he sort of finds a new way to just sort of lump it all together. Um, you know, how Great uh, comment here from Media Hits describing the Bronze Age mindset worldview. The world is ending. Why date girls? Why buy a home? Why build a career? Why get educated? Just sit at home and watch anime. How can unsuppressible vital youth energy possibly be suppressed? The answer is an overgrowth of yeast life. Each individual cell, me and you, mm -hmm. plus... Trans people, people of color, on and on. All the classics. Each individual cell is subhuman and inferior, but all together uh, it becomes like this stifling organism that can suppress the unsuppressible by sheer mass. Yeah. Part two of the book, The Parable of the Iron Prison. Mm. Basically, what he's describing, what the Iron Prison is, is a mashup of what you and I would call neoliberalism mm -hmm. and you and me. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm. <laughs> it's the global world order and woke capitalism and lefty critiques of the global world order and woke capitalism. In his book, he just calls this whole thing the Iron Prison. Um, though since the book's publication, he's really preferred Globo Homo. Uh, so yeah, Christianity developed in an apocalyptic mindset that the world was about to come to an end. You know, why get married? You know, why build anything? Everything was going to get burned up anyway. And uh, for 2,000 years, Christians have been waiting for the world to burn up and Jesus to come back and save them. That's the catch-all now. That's the catch-all. Yep, Globo Homo. This is kind of like the big word cloud vital fire of masculine syrup from part one. And in the same way, his ideas about the Iron Prison are kind of half-baked. And that's somewhat intentional. He wants the reader to finish the work. Mm. It's take and bake pizza, mm -hmm. you know? Still, this is one of the most lucid sections of the book, thanks to some evocative writing, such as, quote, when I speak of something like owned space, it must not remain... Remember 2009, 2010, there are all these movies, uh, The Road, about the end, of, the end of the world, apocalyptic movies like The Road or The Book of Eli... Uh, yeah, the Apostle Paul says, better not to marry, but better to marry than to burn with lust. So Christianity is a romantic religion, right? Spending time in apocalyptic thinking is romantic religion. You're seeing more to reality than is really there. By contrast, the, the sages of the Jewish tradition, most rabbis have put their primary focus on how, how you conduct yourself today. And 
you know, building up possessions, building up wealth, building up a family, you know, building up skills, building up your connections to your family, your friends, your, your community. These are all good things to make life better today. So you will often see Jews will make complaints if the air conditioning is uh, two degrees too cold or two degrees not cold enough. Like, there's no mitzvah in, in Judaism as understood by most Jews to suffer. Well, for, for Christians, everyone has to suffer. Christ suffered on a cross. There's much more valorization of, of suffering and of a romantic vision of life, much more focus on the end times, what happens in heaven. In Christianity, Judaism pays virtually no attention to what will happen in the uh, next life. So you go to a Christian church, and it's a much more transcendent, otherworldly experience because Christianity is much more of a transcendent, otherworldly religion. Judaism is the most most this world focused of the world's religions may near word when you understand something i mean you must see and feel it like you would a landscape you know from youth how to navigate all its nooks the different heights of earth the banks of streams where the trees are and how it feels inside them how long it takes walking from this or that group of beach to the abandoned fa- yeah the talmudic rabbi said that if someone tells you the messiah is coming and you're outside planting your field uh, finish planting your field and then come in and find out if uh, the Messiah is really coming. And uh, there's an old Jewish joke about a man says he's got a job waiting by the, the tower of the city, w- waiting to, to spot the Messiah. And uh, apparently the pay isn't very good, but the good thing about the job is that it is for life. Factory, so that the map is already in your body, unquote. One of the things I find interesting about this quote is that he's describing his childhood. Mm. So he's talking about either Newton, Massachusetts, or Bucharest, Romania. And in the next section of the book, he's got just this diatribe where he just rants about the suburbs, where he's clearly talking about Newton. Mm. Um, and he calls the suburbs an absolute hell to raise children in, especially boys. He complains further that... I mean, this idea that the suburbs are just absolute hell to raise children in, right? Mo- most people who are actually raising children don't think this way. So Kostan Alamariu, aka Bronze Age pervert, has... All the characteristics of, you know, the, the modern charlatan guru, including all these proclamations on things that he knows absolutely nothing about. Right? People move to the suburbs to raise children. There are no nooks and crannies where boys can form gangs, be away from prying eyes or parents and others, and have the feeling that they are exploring and owning territory as there is in the city of the countryside. So in this section where he's talking about the Iron Prison, Kostin's kind of describing the problem that is philosophy, for lack of a better word, is meant to solve. It's the dominant system of governance. Well, I think... What he's talking about that here is try that in a small town. And you can have that same kind of ethic of uh, try that in a small town. You can have that in a big city if you're part of you know, some kind of traditional community. All right? So try that stuff in a small town, right, if you are wired into any kind of traditional community, and it's not going to go. You do have a sense of, of space and, and owning space when you're part of a, a tight-knit community, all right? All right, try to sucker punch somebody, all right, when you're part of a small community, carjack an old lady at a red light, pull a gun on the owner of a liquor store, you think it's cool, act a fool if you like, well, cuss out a cop, spit in his face, stomp on the flag and light it up, you think you're tough, well, try that in a small town, try that in any closely-knit community. You can have closely-knit communities in a big city. You can have a close-knit community in Beverly Hills, in Manhattan, you can have this ethos of a small town in those places if you are strongly connected to others. Right? See how far you make it down the road when you try to pull that stuff in a small, tight-knit community. Right? In a small, tight-knit community, we take care of our own. You cross that line, it won't take long for you to find out. I recommend you don't. Try that in a small town. Right? Try that with a tight-knit, effective, high IQ community. Right? See how far you make it down the road, right? People who are raised up right, who are looking to take care of their own, not going to let you try that stuff in their small town, even if their small town happens to be in Beverly Hills or Manhattan, right? There are a lot of uh, tight-knit groups that are very effective at harnessing law enforcement, uh, government powers, their, their own powers to provide incentives for outsiders not to come along and muck things up, right? There are plenty of tight-knit communities in Beverly Hills and Manhattan, Miami Beach, right, that look after their own. They keep a a watch out for 
outsiders with uh, bad intentions. Right? Something goes down that's negative for your community. You spread the word. People get trained. People carry guns lawfully. People form uh, neighborhood watch programs. They, they form security services so they can legally carry g guns. So try that tomfoolery in a small town. Right? Try that grooming in a small town. Try that perversity. Try getting away with that in a small town. Like come into some tight-knit synagogue or church and start trying to play with kids who are not your own. Right? Try pulling that stuff in a small town. Right? Let's, let's see how far you go. I don't think you're going to get very far. ...some control in the U.S. and Europe in particular, but around the world. You know, something you and I know, like we've talked about, that I found a, a super sketchy address for posting online. Mm -hmm. And last summer, uh, I went to a, I went to Boston for a wedding. And... Okay, this is uh, basic journalism. If you become famous enough, right, people will want to know about the community in which you live. Set aside an afternoon to go knock on the door. The Alamarus did used to live there, but they moved to Florida two years previously. Uh, the neighbor I spoke to didn't know them, but vaguely remembered their son. Talk about due diligence, by the way. Would. It was an opportunity. Listen here, listener. <laughs> this man put his life on the line. He went and knocked <laughs> on the door. Went knocked on, like, yep, in, in suburban Boston. <laughs> hey, so those are mean suburbs. No, I was gonna say, Be careful. Get out of my yard. I spear you. <laughs> yeah. I just, like, walked around, though, and tried to imagine, like, what baby pervert saw when he was cruising the neighborhood on his Huffy. I'm in Newton Center, Massachusetts. Not too far from the uh, Harvard campus. It's very prosaic here. Very stereotypically suburban. It's even literally a white picket fence. Behind Almaru's house. He said the trip was mostly a bust. Uh, Almaru didn't live there and hadn't for a long time. But I did notice something that I thought was worth sharing, actually about the architecture, <laughs> which is really funny. But, uh, you know, Newton has been a middle class to wealthy liberal enclave for a very long time. And the buildings reflected a lot of the values of the people who lived in them. You know, you can sort of see in these houses the material promises of the New Deal that are, like, exemplified in the post-war ramblers, slowly being supplanted, first by these big boxy monstrosities whose only notable aesthetic quality is that they're fucking big, and then later by just these gaudy McMansions that copy this or that classic or modern style is cheap. Okay, the chat says this uh, try that in a small town mentality is how Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin. Well, the reason that Trayvon Martin got killed is that he tried to kill Zimmerman. Trayvon Martin hadn't tried to kill Zimmerman. Zimmerman wouldn't have killed Trayvon Martin. Uh, Sonny says Southern conservatives like fantasize about uh, killing out groups, people that don't fit in. It's not a secret. They've done that for generations. Yeah, that's, that's not a dominant feature of uh, Southern life. It's very much the exception, not the rule. As possible. It's like the March of Progress. You know that picture? I think so, yeah. yeah. yeah and the proof is just look at crime rates in the, the type of small towns that like uh, country music, right? They are much lower than the crime rates in big cities or in towns that don't like country music. Yeah, yeah it's like a uh, human evolution from like monkey to caveman to modern human. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's like this idealized New Deal materialism evolving into woke capitalism. Right. And that's just where he grew up. So you can kind of see where he's coming from a little bit. A little bit. Well, I mean, and also... Um, As a kid. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, um, I kind of vaguely remembered a podcast episode I heard that cited Newton as a case study of liberal hypocrisy in particularly around race. Okay. I couldn't find that, but I did find a PhD dissertation by someone named Louis D. Geismer called Don't Blame Us, Grassroots Liberalism in Massachusetts, 1960 to 1990, that made about the same point. Okay. Quote, by 1970, in an article entitled Liberalism in the Suburbs, Newsweek characterized Newton and its neighbors as the seedbed for liberal causes, such as civil rights, anti-war activism, environmentalism, and feminism. The political activities of grassroots liberals, however, also made this set of affluent communities the sites for the major battles that established lasting constraints upon the ability to create racial, spatial, and economic equality, end quote. At one point, Geismer even uses the word hypocrisy to describe Newton residents' opposition to busing initiatives. Huh. Like he said, you kind of see where he's coming from with that, and kind of, but we're also starting to see like one, a shortcoming to his work, which is that he privileges his own experiences and instincts, right. and he seems to have no analysis of the limitations <laughs> of his own experiences. So everything to his left becomes like just this undifferentiated lump, where right. it's like... You can easily fit new things under it, yeah. and I mean... Uh, he can't escape the suburbs in his mind. If there's anything that I can track about him is that not only are his politics are devoid of any type of empathy or compassion, but that he views those that value those things as subhuman and less than, and I can't believe you would even like begin to have empathy for someone else and base your worldview around that, you get lived hard or whatever. Yeah, I, I did see empathy and compassion as the basis for politics. The basis of politics should be enabling and inspiring and incentivizing the survival of your nation, 
and the prosperity of your nation for your nation's citizens and their progeny. Right? Uh, empathy and compassion have their place in private life. They should not be a basis for government or for politics. Mm -hmm. that, that's just one. Youth. In this part, he sort of lays out his idea of how men can transcend the iron prison to touch that vital beauty, truth, youth slime mold. That's just throbbing away up there in the sky. Um, <laughs> throbbing. Spoiler alert. The answer is variations on a murder-suicide theme. Ugh. Most of this part is parables of men who have done this, transcended the iron prison in some way or another. Uh, most of them are ancient, but uh, one or two modern dudes as well. Uh, in some cases, the suicide is metaphorical, with the men just displaying a lack of concern for their own lives or well-being. Uh, however, and despite his wackiness, Coasting's not an individualist. Uh, the murder-suicide is never about self-aggrandizement. Mm. It's always in service of a grand purpose. For example, he references Achilles throughout the book, who, in his mythologizing, was filled with a spirit of fire by the goddess Athena and went on a suicidal rampage. He links that rampage to a larger political goal. Quote, and you must understand one thing. The end of Achilles' mission was the total destruction of the city of Troy, the fire melting the brick of its alleys, its men killed, its women and children sold into slavery. This last was held to be the right of conquerors throughout the history of the Greek world, or at least for its vital period of ascent. End quote. The, the grand fire, the culminating event or whatever. Isn't that just fucking like Bane from Batman? Wasn't that just like <laughs> the whole thing? Then whatever comes afterwards, you know, whether the, the gangs of vigilantes take over or whether it's, you know, but it's all about creating the great fire. Yeah. He's an accelerationist. I mean? Right. Yeah. But anyway, continue. Okay. Um, the very opening lines of this section are the ones that first intrigued me by their sheer fashionness. The life appears at his peak, not in the grass, have village, blah, blah, blah. but in the military state. This is also the section that shows the influence of pickup artist culture most clearly, which mm. you may not expect. There's this guy, Hartiste, uh, was or is. I don't know if he's still writing. I don't really give a shit, honestly. He's a pickup artist. Blah. Yeah, Chateau Hartiste, I believe he's still posting on Gab. He very carelessly did not back up you know, dozens of his drafts of posts. He did not back up his website. And so when WordPress determined that his website violated his terms of service, they deleted it. Chateau Hatis was so careless, he didn't have it backed up. And uh, that was just a killer blow to his ego, and uh, he hasn't been productive since. Logger, who Coasting name drops online, but not really in the book. Uh, he was popular in the late 2000s to the early 2010s when Coasting... Uh, it's kind of an example of how underowning can kill you. All right, if you are so careless that y your passion project has, has no backup, right? Life will inevitably throw you a curveball, and if you don't have things backed up, if you don't have contingencies, if you are not wired into connections with other people, family, friends, community, all right, you're just going to be knocked off your feet, and you just have to make one bad decision for everything to come to an end. So for Chateau Hartis, he was posting prolifically. He endured one setback, and it has pretty much ended his posting career. He, he could not... He could not overcome that, that one setback. He, he lacked enough emotional flexibility to be able to deal with that one downturn in life. He was developing his ideas, and uh, Hartiste's 16 Commandments of Poon illustrate his influence Jesus on Christ. Christ. Diving into the bio, man. Yep. I'm swimming in shit. Where were we? Hertie's 16 Commandments of Poon illustrate his influence on Coasting, with commandments such as, you shall make your mission, not your woman, your priority and ignore her beauty, and be irrationally self-confident. Wow. Okay, that, that's pretty good advice for life. I mean, you should not make your, your woman your primary purpose in life. Women won't respond well. Women want you to have, you know, a higher purpose than just, you know, seeking their approval. So some, some good stuff there. You're irrationally self-confident. Yeah, does that remind you of? Yeah, be irrationally self-confident in some situations is adaptive. In other situations, it's maladaptive. It's not like confidence or appropriate levels of confidence or irrational levels of confidence are just always right or always wrong. It depends on the situation. Right? There are times when you should pause. There are the times when you should ask for help. There are times when you should bounce off your ideas of other people. There are times that you should be in, in a subservient position, taking directions from others. Right? You don't want to go through life with absurd levels of now, There's one story in uh, Cosine's book of Hippocleides, an ancient Greek historical figure. In Cosine's parable, Hippocleides goes to a feast to try to win the hand in marriage of some... Ricardo says, women want to be impregnated. Best my wife ever treats me is when she's actively trying to get pregnant. Suddenly, she cares about keeping me in the mood to have sex with her. Yeah. So, everybody has an agenda. And the more you live in reality, right, the less mono-focused you are on yourself, the more attuned you will be to other people's agenda and therefore the better you'll be able to get along with them. Right? Take, take, take a little time, figure out what's on top of someone else's agenda. It very likely will not be the same thing that is on top of your agenda. 
aristocrat's daughter. He's basically won the competition uh, when he's touched by that vital, brutal, masculine truth soup force, and he dances upside down on a table, and the father tells him he's out of the competition, but Hippocleides says, quote, Hippocleides doesn't care, end quote. Mm. Costein explains the parable, quote, In this one phrase, you have the whole attitude of this beautiful, reckless, piratical aristocracy that colonized and conquered their known world. It's an attitude that upsets all the moral fags of our time, of the left and right. Hippocleides went there to have a good time, to display and use his powers and excellence and biological superiority. But these two things are the same. He didn't care about the gain or loss of a wife. He didn't go to act like a meek, beaten male. Back to the 16 Commandments of Poon. Pickup artists like Hartiste were like looking for the secret key to fucking any woman they wanted, and somewhere along the way, one of the key elements became stop caring about women. As Hartiste put it in his 16 Commandments, make your mission, not your woman, your priority. Costein's taken this a step further and cut out women altogether. He sort of like moved the art of the pickup to the political realm, where it's definitely fascist. You know, it's like this powerful, aloof, real man using his innate powers to pull in the masses. There's this great Susan Sontag essay called Fascinating Fascism, uh, where she says, quote, a clue lies in the predilections of the fascist leaders themselves for sexual metaphors. Like Nietzsche and Wagner, Hitler regarded leadership as sexual mastery of the feminine masses as rape. End quote. On a side note, remember how I said I strongly suspect that Kostin obscures lefty influences? Oh yeah. This is another example of that. The only time I've ever seen him speak positively of a leftist writer is in a forum post encouraging people to go read that Susan Sontag essay, Fascinating Fascism. He calls it a hostile and liberal review, but even so it is educational, shows what the other side thinks. Mm. Years later, he's still talking about that essay. This is from the same episode we heard earlier. Academic faggots are much concerned with theories of things like homofascism. That's a word they use. Or fascist aesthetic. They, I don't know if they use that particular one anymore from uh, Susan Sontag, but uh, the concept was inherited and uh, you could say refined. The fact that this is a queer woman he's talking about is all the more amazing. And it kind of highlights how precarious he is intellectually, that he can't even acknowledge influences like Sontag because it contradicts the central message of his cis male superiority. Well, in, insofar as that he will give them any... Look, if a queer woman is right or, or wise, then you have to, you should give a credit if you're a person of integrity. If a, a black man or a Jewish man or a homosexual man or a Mexican man or a Japanese woman or a, I don't know, Nigerian transsexual says something that's wise and profound, you should give them appropriate credit. Hint of credit. He rolls it out as like opposition research the same way that I would if I'm trying to share information on a particular fascist or something like that. He's like, well, I don't agree with them, but I mean, this is how they think. You know what I mean? <laughs> Difference is I happen to be right and he happens to be wrong. Oh, so. see, and I'm just over here like, I love Bronze Age pervert. <laughs> Give me the fash. Yeah. And then let me, let me you're, you're actually like the, <laughs> the, the one that is trying to understand it in like the deepest way possible. And I'm like, I understand enough. Fuck this fucking guy. <laughs> That's all you really need to know. <laughs> bo bo both approaches are <laughs> fine. Both are good. <laughs> Uh, oh, but anyways, part four of Kostin's book is called A Few Arrows. Um, in his review of the book, Michael Anton brushes off this section, but I disagree with Mr. Anton. Uh, like I said, Kostin's book climaxes in this section. This is the heart of what he's been saying and building to. Uh, maybe Anton's right that like philosophically or intellectually, the final section doesn't add anything, but Kostin's a vitalist. For him, intellectual pursuits are only as valuable as the impact they have on the world, and this section is where he lays out his vision of how disciples could prepare for a fascist revolution. It's a lot of practical advice, tactics about how to further the cause. It's a lot of weightlifting, memeing, infiltrating military and security services, and a whole chapter dedicated to the transcendent glory of bros before hoes. People hoping to understand or contend against the right in online, intellectual, and cultural spaces could do worse than to read this part of the book, though. This is all the, the practical, nitty-gritty, nuts and bolts. And if you wanted to be a fascist operative, you know... Or if you were a lefty and you wanted to learn how fascists thought about what they were doing on the internet. Yeah, but that's a waste of time. Don't, don't do that. That's such a waste. <laughs> You're undercutting me, Miles. You're supposed to be supportive. Oh, I'm sorry. You're supposed to believe in me. All right, I'll, I'll put my other hat back on. All right, keep going. Okay. Last time I'll interrupt. No, that's it. I mean, that's his book now. That's it. That's the book. That's the book. That's part four. Uh, yep, that's it. One through so, four. There should be like a really familiar fascism in Kostin's writing. It's, uh, like this transcendent truth of biology as expressed in race and gender, uh, rigid elitist hierarchy, the assertion that only those at the top of the heap have any right to rule, climaxing with the leadership principle, and a cult of violence and death all sewed up in a perfect erotic but not garment. And any scenes are covered by his bulletproof vest if I don't write it for you. Um, I roll my eyes at him. Uh, that's probably clear. But I've tried to describe his thoughts while staying inside the boundaries he lays out. But as you said, fuck him. Right. 100%. <laughs> let's stop playing his game, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Let's go hard. Okay. So to start with, let's just call bullshit on his idea of vitalism. This eternal truth, beautiful young man soup and see what happens. Uh, now that flame of life, word soup, that only makes sense if, A, there actually is a fascist god spirit above and behind the material world that only a select group of elite men are capable of experiencing. Or if, B... He's mistaking his feelings um, for mystical truth. Oh, feelings? I just think he has feelings. Oh, well, he certainly feels a way about women. <laughs> um, 
He's touched by the divine limb of something. <laughs> right? but, but I mean, like, obviously, there's not a fascist god spirit. No. That's a fantasy. 100%. So what we're left with is the core of his ideology, his philosophy, his whole project, his brand of fascism. It's just his own emotions, which he sort of imbued with mystical and political meaning. Yeah, I think that's a pretty accurate analysis. Uh, Look forward, how did the Biden corruption charges affect your view of them? I primarily see politics in terms of structure, not in terms of personalities. I haven't probably spent five minutes thinking about the Biden corruption charges. I don't think I've read one article about them. I, I don't think the Biden corruption charges have made any difference to me. The charges of corruption against Donald Trump also don't make any difference, I think, in terms of structure it doesn't really matter that much if uh, the Biden family is corrupt but what matters is the structures of an economy and the structures of a military and the structures of a system and how effectively and efficiently it meets the challenges put before it so I would overall I'd give uh, Joe Biden a, a C grade I think I'm, I'm not talking about just like you know, falling in love or being scared or whatever. I mean, I, I mean, like, really specifically, say, the way he feels about trans people. Right. Whatever visceral reaction he has to trans people, he's mistaking that for, like, a message from God. Right. Essentially. Did uh, Shatu Hatis ever get docked? Yeah. His uh, real name and information was uh, spread, spread across the internet. His transphobia, the discomfort he feels around women, his xenophobia, and on and on. And I'm not being flippant when I said he makes these feelings magical. He has a whole thing about how he isn't a materialist and how there's a mystical truth beyond physical matter. He even calls hormones big magic. This is where we're going to start harkening back to his biography. He's brilliant, but he's not exceptional, right? Like when, we, when, he go, when he goes home, he's got his brother there who's well on his way to becoming the kind of person that transnational banks make into a VP. And then his father's there at home, uh, who's an experimental research engineer at MIT. I couldn't find too much about his mother, though someone with her name got a master's in education from UMass Boston in 1997. So she's also pretty smart. Not a slouch. Yeah. You know, and then he goes to school and he's outshined by the internationally famous for their charisma, BJ Novak and John Krasinski, <laughs> you know, AKA Ryan and Jim from The Office. He clearly struggles to talk to girls. He shows up to school dances in a blonde wig and a tweed jacket. Okay, let's uh, get some uh, Fox News coverage here of uh, the new Jason Aldean song. And is responsible for nearly 30% of the country's shipping. Well, country music star Jason Aldean is performing, uh, I mean, he performed last night in Wisconsin, and he is now speaking out about his controversial video. You know, it's gotten a lot of backlash across the country. That just shot it to number one. The music video and his song, Try That in a Small Town, has come under fire because some people say it has racial and violent overtones. Well, Aldine directly addressed that controversy when he was on the stage in Cincinnati on Friday night. What I am is a proud American. I'm proud to be from here. I love our country. I want to see it restored to what it once was before all this b started happening to us. I love my country. I love my family, and I will do anything to protect that. I can tell you that right now. Well, critics have been saying that Try That in the Small Town music video has racial undertones. Aldine denies that, and he says that what's happening is an example of cancel culture. Yeah, it's got uh, racial overtones because it's against carjacking. And it's against disrespecting cops, and it's against uh, breaking and entering, and uh, robbing liquor stores, and that's that's racist to be against those things. Art thou? But My God, the, the the racism, off the hook. I tell people he thinks they're wearing his underwear. Like I imagine him as a high schooler, you know, all those familiar angsty feelings, walking around the neighborhood, and what's he see? Textbook liberal hypocrisy deep-seated racism and elitism hidden under platitudes about equality and civil rights. And right alongside it, at least in his mind, is Ceausescu's Romania, which is another kind of leftist liberal hypocrisy. You know, there's actually another fora post uh, where he calls for a natalist program for whites. Um, natalist? Natalist. Okay. Yeah, probably, yeah. Got you. I'd never heard the term natalist Got you. before, so I looked it up, and it's a policy. Yeah, it's amusing because Bronze Age Pervert has absolutely no time for women. Doesn't you know, particularly respect the, the idea of a family, building a family, having kids. Right. These things are of no interest to him compared to the homoerotic joys of you know, banging uh, fellow aristocrats of the spirit. So you designed to encourage high birth rates. You seem to have heard the word before. <laughs> right. Yeah. I have friends that are anti-natalist, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole set of politics. Wow. There's n no way he avoided trauma. No one who lived through the Ceausescu regime did. Right, of course not. 
but also something I learned after we recorded that last episode, um, the Socialist Party, which Ceausescu eventually became the leader of, the control of Romania from a fascist regime. And many of Romania's anti-communist folk heroes were fascists. How much, how much fascist romanticism was around when he was growing up? Maybe none. Right. Bucharest stayed with him. Mm -hmm. At some point in high school, or shortly after that, he finds his way onto the internet along with the rest of us, and he finds a community that's actively working to reconcile all the same conflicting emotions and realities that he is. And eventually it becomes the alt-right. Um, I just want to like acknowledge that I'm on pretty shaky ground here. I'm like trying to read another man's soul, but I'm not the only person who's seen this in Coasting. Here's David LeBeau, a former Yale classmate of Coasting's, and we spoke in part one. I'm reminded of Nietzsche, with whom I think he thought very uh, much about, who, you know, these blonde beasts at the beginning who just um, did violence because they didn't know any better. And they just, um, they were just pure vital energy and they were unbounded. And that part meant dominating without giving it a second thought. And then there's this priestly revolt where morality comes in to, to, to tame them, to, to subordinate them. And then um, mankind is never the same again. And there's no way to go back to, those, to the blonde beasts. There's no way to become as innocently destructive as they were um, because we're too smart. And I think about him there. I mean, he, I don't think he's a well person. Let me say, I don't think he's, I don't think he's schizophrenic or anything like that. But I don't think he's a mentally well person. And I think there's something about um, the provocation that might have been some sort of, and I'm speculating here, um, some sort of compensation for a sort of insecurity. Like, like I wasn't very myself. I wasn't that popular in middle school. And then I remember um, consciously cultivating my sense of humor uh -huh. so that I would, I would, and I turned out it's the relevant sense. But I'm actually extremely funny. And it was because it was um, a way to compensate for a, 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 a felt lack of social standing. And I wonder if, um, again, I don't know what the context of his upbringing was, yeah. but I think there's some way in which the provocation, um, and the, the provocation is a way to set himself apart from other people and to somehow feel superior and to hurt people who maybe have things he didn't. Um, I think there's something to that. And when I see the pictures of the blonde beast constantly on his website, um, I can't help but think that there's a sort of yearning to, I don't know if it's to be with, but I think it's certainly yearning to be those people and a a knowledge at some deeper level that he won't and can't possibly ever look like that. So he will never be the, 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 you know, the king to go rape and slay the way he, or you know, steal others' women. That's what so much of the website's about, about mm. the most vital just take, takes your woman. And yeah. it's, it's very, it's jarring to see that come from him because, or it's not, I think it's quite typical, um, because that would, never, that would never be him. The blonde beast that he, that he talks about would never be tweeting on a website um, pictures of people and writing down all these no mix phrases about the, the war to come or whatever. They would be out there doing things without thinking about it. So the very fact that he's writing these tweets is a testament to how impossible um, or how wide the gulf between him as a person and these fantasy ideals of what the great heroic people look like are. He, by, by creating his website, is testifying 